To begin this timeline, we need to start back in age 765 during the 23rd World Martial Arts Tournament. After a long and grueling fight, Goku would have just barely managed to win the tournament against Piccolo Jr., which, Judge Ravisaur comes over and gives a sense of being to Goku so that he doesn't have to go to the hospital. Then, as Kami comes over to try and kill the now defenseless Piccolo Jr., Goku intervenes and stops him. As Goku reveals to the others that he would die if he killed Piccolo Jr., Kami goes on to say he has no right to be the god anymore. This is where Master Roshi interjects and says without the Dragon Balls, Goku would have never become what he is to save the world. So, Kami goes on to say he found a wise mentor that gives Goku a gi with a turtle hermit symbol on it. As usual, Goku then gives Piccolo Jr. a sensu beam, which he then promises to kill Goku and take over the world. Then he flies off. From there, while Goku and Chi Chi are celebrating, Kami approaches Goku and offers to take his place as the Guardian of Earth. Goku, as usual, still refuses this offer and takes off with Chi Chi on the Flying Nimbus. Here is also where the change from the original timeline happens, as in this timeline, Kami would still be thinking he isn't worth being the next Guardian. So, he would start to think about who else could be his replacement, and the main two options would be Master Roshi or Tien. Both are good options, as Tien tried to help in the fight with King Piccolo, going as far to learn the evil containment wave. Then as for Master Roshi, he gave his life for the Earth once already, when he tried to steal King Piccolo away like Master Mutaito did all those years ago. Also, Kami's seen him demonstrate his wisdom not long ago, so he also thinks that would be a good trait for the Guardian of Earth to have. It's also a plus that Master Roshi already went through Korn's training where he had to get the sacred water. However, he also knows about Roshi she's wicked and perverted side, but he once had an evil side himself, so he would know this can be worked with. So, he would approach Master Roshi after Goku took off and offer him to go under training to be the next Guardian of Earth. Now, as for whether Roshi would take this offer or not could be up to debate, though, from what we have seen in the Tournament of Power, Roshi has been training secretly to get stronger. We have no idea when he started training like that, but it easily could have been after the Piccolo Jr. Saga, since he would have seen how close Goku came to being defeated. So, for the sake of this timeline, I'll say he has a desire to start training again at this point, and Kami's offer would be a great chance for him to train, even if, for some reason, he doesn't doesn't become the next Guardian of Earth, he still got to train with Kami and improve that way. So, I believe Master Roshi would agree to Kami's offer, so Kami would teleport himself and Roshi up to the lookout after he says goodbye to everyone there. After that, everyone else who came to watch the tournament leaves, with them all returning home. Master Roshi's first year of training with Kami would be much like Goku's time training with Kami, as it would mainly be going over the basics of his training, which, unfortunately, in the manga we don't see what this training entails. However, we do know how strong Goku got from this training, as his power went from 260 to 306. So, that's about a 1.17 times increase, but I believe Roshi would train a little harder since he's trying to become the next Guardian. So I'll increase his boost on his basic training with Kami to 1.2 times. So, Roshi usually has his power suppressed to 139, but his full power is 180. After this boost, his power would go up to 167 when suppressed and 216 when it isn't suppressed. Then, for his advanced training with Kami in preparation to become Guardian, there's two potential routes I can go with this. I can either go with him having to split his evil side from himself like Kami did, or I can have him go the route of slowly working on controlling his lust over the years. Originally, I didn't plan to go with the route of him separating his evil side from himself, but I think it could be the more interesting option for a story, so I decided to go with it. Which, of course, him splitting his evil side from himself would make him weaker. We don't know how exactly Kami splits himself into two, and if it is just a thing the Mechians can do, or if it was a technique Kami learned how to do. For the sake of this timeline, I will say it is a technique that Kami learned, instead of it being something limited just in the Mechians. So, he would teach the fission technique to Roshi, which would likely take him a bit to master. When he eventually uses this technique, he was split into two people, with his evil half being named Asmo. This name comes from the name of the Demon of Lust, Asmodeus. Also, as mentioned above, Roshi would become weaker from using this technique. It's hard to say how much weaker he would become with part of him being separated. I just went with a simple method of dividing his power in half, since he is splitting into two people. So, both Master Roshi and Asma would have a power level of 108. However, a confrontation doesn't happen between the two, as they would let Asma flee for now. Since they have the same power level, Kami would have seen it pointless to force Roshi to confront his evil counterpart right now. Instead, he can use this as a test for Roshi, since training to confront his evil self could be a goal of his. Normally, the World Martial Arts Tournament doesn't happen again until age 767. However, to make this story slightly more interesting, I'm going to say that they managed to repair the arena by age 759, so that the World Martial Arts Tournament still happens every three years. So, Kami's current plan is for Roshi to confront Asmo at the 24th World Martial Arts Tournament in age 759. 
Anyway, with his evil side now split from himself, he would be able to start his training for the Guardian position. It would take him two years to do this training, but it wouldn't focus on just improving his strength. Of course, it would also focus on improving his spirituality, which is far easier now that his old lustful side was separated from himself. Since Roshi already had a good handle on being spiritually awoken, after his lustful side was separated from himself, there isn't a lot he has to do to achieve this. Anyway, this training would involve him learning the duties of Guardian and practicing doing them himself. Besides watching over the Earth, we don't know a lot about what all the Guardians do. We know that they can travel to other world and guide souls to the other world, so Roshi would likely be taught this as well. This potentially means that Roshi could have been brought to other world to meet King Yama. Not only that, but he might also be brought there to meet King Kai which, if he is made to run Snake Way, it could become part of his training. However, I don't think he would have to train with King Kai once he arrives there, it was just to meet him. Kami would hold off on having him do training with King Kai until after he becomes the Guardian, since that training might be too hard for him as of right now. Regardless, after these three years, Roshi would be ready to become the next Guardian. However, before officially making him the Guardian, Kami has one final test for him. He wants Roshi to go to the 24th World Martial Arts Tournament and face Asmo. In the last two years, Asmo would have been out in the wilderness training as well. While he is essentially Roshi's lustful side incarnate, which means he likely would have gotten himself into loads of trouble over these years, he would also likely have knowledge about martial arts. Since Roshi is a great martial arts master, the martial arts likely came to Asmo naturally. At some point, he likely would have seen a flyer advertising the 24th World Martial Arts Tournament, which the prize money would be more than enough of a reason for Asmo to join the tournament. Kami would have noticed this, so he decided to make Roshi's final test fighting Asmo in the tournament, since what better way to literally overcome your demons by facing the evil side of yourself? Who knows, this might even lead to them being able to merge back into one person down the road. Anyway, when the time comes for the tournament, even though Asmo isn't threatening the world like Piccolo was, Kami would allow Roshi to tell the other heroes about it, so that they could join as well. After all, Roshi potentially facing his former students again could be a good way to test his growth too. Also, if they go against Asmo and lose, it would be a good way to observe the power of their enemy. Anyway, with the heroes going their separate ways before, it might be hard to find some of them. However, since Roshi can now view the Earth like Kami can, he would be able to locate them. Yamcha is an easy one to find, since after the defeat of Piccolo, he went on to become a baseball player. He also still stays at Castle Corporation with Bulma, so this in combination with him being in the public eye makes it easy to find. When Roshi explains to him what is happening, he would agree to join the tournament. Another easy one for Roshi to find is Krillin, as he would have been watching a Kame house for Roshi while he was away. Of course, after being told the situation, Krillin would join the tournament too. As for the hard ones to find, Tien and Shotsky were harder to find. However, as mentioned above, with the help of Kami and being able to view the Earth, they would locate Tien and Shotsu. Since they've been out in the wilderness training, they would agree to join too. The last ones Roshi would go to recruit would also be easy to find, as he would know where Goku lives. Goku is an easy one to convince to join the tournament, since he's easily excited by the idea of fighting someone strong. Chi Chi is harder to convince, as by this time she would have already had Gohan and wouldn't want to leave him alone. However, I think Roshi would easily be able to convince her to join by saying he could find someone to watch Gohan, which he would likely ask either Kami or Bulma to watch Gohan, since they both would be at the tournament to watch it. This would be able to convince Chi Chi since both are intelligent and could help teach Gohan something, though he is only two at this time, so he wouldn't be learning anything too advanced. This is a good start on her dream of him becoming a scholar. So, though it does take some convincing from both Roshi and Goku, Chi Chi would agree to join the tournament as well. So, now that Roshi gathered all the heroes, they would take off towards the tournament arena together. Once the day the tournament arrives, all the heroes would meet up there as they had planned to do, though others would have come along to watch the fights, such as Bulma, Oolong, Poir, and Launch. Even Kami would show up to watch the tournament, which would surprise some of the spectators. At first, they were worried the world was being threatened again like it was by Piccolo Jr. three years ago. However, Kami would quickly explain to them that the world isn't being threatened. He is just there to see how his newest student, Master Roshi, does. Though, he would be honest about the threat of Asmo, as he would explain to them how Roshi had to separate his evil side from himself before he could become the next Guardian. Of course, this also means that he would mention that Asmo is participating in the tournament, so if they see another person that looks like Roshi, they'll know it isn't Roshi. Regardless, Goku is the last one to arrive, as usual, though Chi Chi would be there with him as well. Also, they would have brought Gohan along, which is a shock to everyone except Roshi, Kami, and Bulma. They didn't know that Goku had a child, but both he and Chi Chi would quickly introduce Gohan to everyone. It wasn't a shock to Bulma since Roshi kept his promise of finding someone to watch Gohan, so he asked Bulma to. When he told her about Gohan, it was a shock, but that feeling had worn off by the time she met Gohan. Finally, the last one to arrive would be Asmo, which if it wasn't for his different colored clothes, easily would have been confused for Roshi. Speaking about the color of his clothes, there is a reason they made the main color of his clothes blue. Since Asmo is Roshi's lustful and evil side, I decided to look up colors that represented lust. Originally, I thought it was going to be red that was associated with lust, but I was wrong. Apparently, blue is the color that is traditionally associated with lust, which I don't understand why. Though, I decided to go with it, 
since that color made sense in another way for this, Master Roshi's main color is orange, which the complementary color of orange is blue. This means that they are on opposite sides of the color wheel, which this works well since it can represent how they are opposites of each other, as Roshi is the good side and Asmo is the evil side. Anyway, when Asmo arrives, he wouldn't be too surprised to see the heroes there. Since Roshi can sense energy, Asmo inherited that ability as well. So, when Roshi started to train intensely and get stronger, Asma decided to train in preparation for the tournament as well. Anyway, with him being a lustful in nature, he'd likely do something perverted like how Roshi used to, especially since Balma, Chi Chi, and Launch are there. Regardless, everyone would sign up for the tournament and head to the area where the preliminaries are, while Kami, Bulma, and the others went to find seats in the stands. In the preliminaries, there likely wouldn't be that many matches that are exciting or important enough to mention. At most, there might be one or two that would be worthwhile to go over. One potential fight is if Asmo fights against a female fighter in the preliminaries, there would likely be a fight like Roche's fight against Kawei in the Tournament of Power. When he inevitably tries to do something perverted, she would run and jump out of the ring like Kawei did. The other potential fight that is worth mentioning in the preliminaries is one between Asmo and Yajirobe. He would have only come to the tournament after Kami and Roshi stopped at Korin's tower and told him about it, so Korin had him join the fight as well. Anyway, Yajirobe wouldn't have trained at all, so he didn't get any stronger since the last time they seen him. So, when he does go against Asmo, he's beaten easily. At least this would give the fighters a chance to see how Asmo fights. Which, his fighting style is basically like Roshi's, but since he gives into his emotions more, there might be times he fights erratically. Regardless, he would knock Yajirobe out of the ring, which gains him a spot in the main tournament. As for the heroes, they all would have passed the preliminaries easily. They would all head to the backstage part of the arena to draw lots for the main tournament. Besides Asmo, all the fighters are the heroes, so some of them will end up going against some of the other heroes. After they draw lots, the fights in the quarterfinals of the tournament are as follows. Match 1 is Shotsu vs. Chi Chi, Match 2 is Yamcha vs. Asmo, Match 3 is Tien vs. Goku, and Match 4 is Krillin vs. Master Roshi. Since the fight is between Shotsu and Chi Chi, they both would enter the ring together. This would be a friendly match, as Shotsu is a friend of Goku's, so Chi Chi would likely see him as a friend as well. We're never given a statement about Shotsu's power level between the 22nd World Martial Arts Tournament and the Saiyan Saga, so I am going to assume his power level is the same as it was back then, which was 60. As for Chi Chi, since she was training to fight Goku, I think she would have trained a little with him as well, at least until she got pregnant, which caused her to stop training, and after Gohan was born, she never picked up training again. This means that her power level would only be slightly higher than what it was in the 23rd World Martial Arts Tournament. She had a power level of 130 in that tournament, so I put her power at 140 this time. When they start the fight, Chi Chi would likely keep her power suppressed at first, so that it would be like a friendly sparring match between the two. When their fight begins, they would be going blow for blow with each other at first. Since Chi Chi was suppressed, neither would be able to get the upper hand, so Shotsu would try using his telekinesis. Since Chi Chi hasn't fought him and hasn't seen him fight before, this would have caught her off guard. So, he would be able to hold her in place with his telekinesis while he started to attack her. Though, this wouldn't last for long, since when she stopped suppressing her power, she would be able to easily break out of this. Since she would be using her full power now, she would be knocking Shotsu around easily. She then knocked him out of the ring, making her the winner of this match. Next match is Yamcha vs. Asmo, so they would both enter the ring. For the power of these two, I say Yamcha's had a power between what he was in the 22nd World Martial Arts Tournament and the beginning of the Saiyan Saga, which is 154. And as for Asmo, I just made his equal to what I made Roshi's. So, when he is in his full power state, Asmo's power level is 361. When they begin to fight, Yamcha's attacks wouldn't be affecting Asmo at all. Even when he tried to use techniques like the Wolf Fang Fist, they wouldn't work either. Unlike when Yamcha fought Tien, his fight against Asmo wouldn't be nearly as brutal. Even though he's Roshi's evil side, he's gonna have a wrathful side to him. His main flaw is just his lust. Regardless, Yamcha would try his best, but Asmo easily knocks him out of the ring. The third match is between Tien, Shen, Han, and Goku, so it would be like yet another rematch between the two. However, Tien's power only increased to 242 by this time, while Goku's increased more dramatically, as it is now 297 while wearing his weights. I came up with their power levels the same way I did Yamcha's, but this time I made their powers between theirs in the 23rd tournament and theirs in the beginning of the Saiyan Saga. Anyway, in our last fight, Goku needed to take up his weights to fight with him the last time, but he wouldn't need to this time. When Tien would be getting hits on Goku, and they would affect him, they wouldn't do nearly as much damage to Goku like the hits that are landing on Tien. Overall, though, it would be a friendly match, even if Tien doesn't stand a chance. Unlike their first fight, when Tien tries to use his tri beam, he wouldn't warn Goku about dodging it. He isn't doing this out of malice, he just thinks that Goku will know to move out of the way. To his surprise, after he fires the blast, Goku doesn't move out of the way. This also kicked up dust, so everyone couldn't see Goku, which worried them at first. However, once the dust cleared, they could see Goku standing there, unscathed. 
He would then use his speed to appear behind Tien, as he then kicked him out of the ring. With him now eliminated, Goku would congratulate him on the good fight. Tien would congratulate him as well, but he would still vow to train even harder for the next time they fight. The fourth and final fight of the quarterfinals is between Krillin and Master Roshi. I came up with Krillin's power level the same way I did with Tien's, so his power level is 201. As for Master Roshi's, all I came up with his power level was a little more complex. Before Roshi began his complex training with Kami, I think Kami would have had him try to drink the Ultra Divine Water on Korin's lookout as a test. Assuming it increased his power by the same multiplier it did for Goku, this is what have brought his power from 108 to 156. Then from his intense training with Kami for two years, I decided not to make the multiplier as high as the one from training with Kami in the Saiyan Saga, and only made it a 3 times multiplier this time, which brought Roshi's power up to 361 when he isn't in his full power state and 468 when he is. Roshi wouldn't be in his full power state during this fight, but he wouldn't hold back, as he wanted to test the strength of his former student. This fight would likely end up being like their fight in the 21st World Martial Arts Tournament, and instead of Roshi dodging all of Krillin's hits this time, he would take them head on to gauge his power. However, Roshi would get hits of his own in on Krillin as well, but he'd still come back to try other techniques on Roshi, but since Roshi wears sunglasses, he wouldn't try to use a solar flare. However, he would try to use a new technique he came up with called the Destructive Disc. After firing it, Roshi would realize how dangerous it was, so he would dodge it instead of trying to take it head on. He then uses speed to appear behind Krillin, as he then knocks him out with one hit. After he regains consciousness, Roshi would praise Krillin for a good fight, but he would also tell him what he needs to work on to continue to improve. Since this was the last match of the quarterfinals, this makes the matches in the semifinals as follows. Match 5 is Chi-Chi vs. Asmo, and Match 6 is Goku vs. Master Roshi. Since the first match of the semifinals is between Chi-Chi and Asmo, they would both enter the ring. Unlike his match against Yamcha, Asmo's lustful side would come out in this fight. When their fight begins, Asmo would try to get up to the usual perverted antics Roshi used to, but Chi-Chi would fight back against this. With Asmo being blinded by his lust, Chi-Chi would be lamely showing hits on him, as she was pummeling him around. This caught Asmo off guard at first, however, he would eventually regain his footing against her, as he then knocked her away from him. After she was knocked away, he would follow up with a flurry of blows of his own. Since his power is far above hers, she wouldn't stand a chance against this, so she would be pushed to the edge of the ring. He would then kick her out of the ring, so he is the winner of this match. As for match 6, it is between Goku and Master Roshi, so it is between the champion of the last World Martial Arts Tournament and his teacher. Much like his fight against Krillin, he would want to test how far his student has come since our last fight in the 21st World Martial Arts Tournament. With Roshi not using his full power and Goku still wearing his weighted clothes, Roshi would have a slight advantage at first. However, it would be a close fight, with the two going blow for blow with each other. However, Goku would eventually be pushed to take off his weighted clothing. This would bring his power level up to 371, so it would make his power ever so slightly above Roshi. Roshi would be impressed with the student's power, but he wouldn't be surprised by this, as he would have seen Goku's power quickly grow many times before. They would trade blows far more than before, with Goku getting slightly more hits in. Like how Goku is pushed to take off his weighted clothing, Roshi is pushed to go into his full power form. With his power level going up to 468, he would quickly gain the advantage over Goku again. As he was beating down the student again, this would cause Goku to decide to use his Kamehameha. While he was charging his, Master Roshi would charge up a Kamehameha of his own as well. When they fire them both, they would meet in the middle, resulting in the beam struggle, though Roshi's coming on hell would begin overtaking his because of the gap in their power. Goku might be able to hold Roshi off briefly, but he can't for long as Roshi's coming on Mihal then knocks him out of the ring. After Roshi dropped down to his regular form, they congratulated each other on the fight, and like how Roshi gave advice to Krillin, he would advise Goku on how he can continue to improve as well. The match in the final round is as follows. Match 7 is Asmo vs Master Roshi. When they both enter the ring, Roshi would try to talk to him about giving up his evil side, like he did with Tien. However, Asmo would be stubborn to change, as his evil side is all he knows. As the fight begins, not only are they completely equal in power, but their hits would be connecting in midair. When Asmo isn't controlled by his emotions, he fights like Roshi does, so they both would be throwing the same hits. This means that they're just counteracting each other at first. Since Kami's training included the Incominent, Roshi can stay level-headed during this fight. Asmo, on the other hand, is starting to get frustrated that his hits aren't doing anything. The more frustrated he gets, the more erratic and sloppier his fighting becomes. This allows Roshi to start landing hits on him, which just frustrates him even more. As he starts knocking Asmo around, he still tries to convince him to give up his life of evil. He would mention how he has had a more peaceful life after giving up his feelings of lust. Though he would also talk about all the friends and adventures he has experienced from being on this side of good. Asmo would still be having none of this, as him getting beaten down and being preached to at the same time just made him even angrier. This pushes Asmo into going to his full power state, as he gains the advantage over Roshi for once. With him in this form, he would be the one pummeling Roshi, as he knocks him closer to the edge. 
Though Orochi is pushed to the edge, he would go into his own full power state. Since Asma is still controlled by his anger, Orochi would easily start knocking him around again. Though Asma would still land in hits, they're not as effective as Roshi since he was sliding sloppily. Eventually, Asma would be pushed into using a Kamehameha out of desperation, so Roshi would be pushed into using his as well. Since they were evenly matched in power, their Kamehameha waves would meet in the middle. With neither of them having the advantage in power, the blast would swell up in the middle and explode, damaging them both. Since this hurt them both, it would be a struggle for both to stand back up. So, it would end up being like the 21st World Martial Arts Tournament, where the first person to stand and declare themselves a winner will win. Since Asma didn't get many good hits on Roshi, but he was pummeled by Roshi a lot, Roshi would be the one to stand up first and declare himself the winner. After he's declared the winner, he would come over to Asma and offer to help him up. While offering to help him up, he would again be offering for Asma to come over to their side. After all, Roshi would think he deserves a chance of having a peaceful and happy life. He figured that since convincing Tien to turn good worked, he may as well try to convince Asma Asma as well. To his surprise, Asma takes his offer, which he mainly took his offer since he didn't have a grudge against any of them like how Piccolo Jr. did. He was only at this tournament for the prize money and to face Roshi, which he got both things he wanted, since there is a runner-up prize as well. Now that the tournament is over, all the heroes go their separate ways again, as Asma goes to the lookout with Roshi and Kami. After the defeat of Asma, Roshi and Kami invited him up to the lookout to train alongside them. While Asma might have been reluctant to do so, he didn't have a grudge against them, so he decided to. After all, he doesn't want revenge against them, so training with them can only be a benefit for him, especially since that life of peace Roshi talked about didn't sound too bad. Regardless, once they arrive at the lookout, Kami would deem that Roshi is now fit to be made the guardian of Earth. Since he's now pure of heart and he has shown that he can protect the Earth if he's needed to, Kami transfers the guardianship to him. While we have seen someone else become the guardian of Earth, we've never seen how one guardian transfers guardianship to another person. Unfortunately, this means I'm not able to go into much detail about how Kami makes Roshi the next guardian. Though now that Kami is no longer the Guardian, he isn't sure what to do anymore. He has been the Guardian for close to 300 years, so it would take him a while to readjust to regular life. However, Roshi would be more than willing to let Kami continue to stay on the lookout, so Kami would still be there for guidance if Roshi ever needed it. There would be times Kami wouldn't help too much though, since he would think Roshi would need to figure out some things on his own, like how Kami had to. After all, Roshi being able to come up with solutions for issues on his own would help show to Kami that he made the right choice of who the next Guardian should be. We don't know if Roshi would have to stop being an Eternal Hermit now that he is the Guardian, but it's possible that he could have to. As we've seen with Kami, the Guardian was unknown to the people of Earth. The Turtle Hermit, on the other hand, was at one point widely known by the public to be a great martial arts master, so that he can remain unknown as the Guardian, he might have to pass on the Turtle School to one of his students. Of course, this means that the options are Goku, Yamcha, and Krillin. If going by power alone, Goku would be the best option, but Roshi would probably take other things into consideration. He would want someone who can pass on the Turtle School fighting style the best, and while Goku does use it, he combined it with styles from his other masters. Then as for Yamcha, his style is mostly combined with his own style from when he was a bandit. So, Krillin's fighting style is the closest one to the Turtle School style, as he hasn't really combined it with anything else. He mainly just kept practicing in the Turtle School way after he originally trained with Roshi. He's also been staying at Kami House, so this makes it simple for Roshi to approach him about being the next Turtle Hermit. It's likely Krillin might be hesitant to take up this mantle, but after some reassuring from Roshi, he would agree to do so. As a gift from Roshi, since Krillin is now the next Turtle Hermit, Kame House would now be his. Then at Goku's house, he and Chi-Chi would have returned with Gohan after the tournament had ended. Since there isn't a known upcoming threat, Goku's training would be relaxed like how it normally was during this time. The main difference here is with Chi-Chi since her interest in fighting was sparked again from the last tournament. So, when Goku starts training again, she would train with him as well. Not only would this allow her to get stronger, but her relationship with Goku would also be healthier than usual, so she wouldn't be strict when it comes to him fighting. As for Gohan, he looked he wouldn't be training now until he was older, but Chi Chi would allow him to train once he is old enough, at the very least. She and Goku is hard to teach him the basics of martial arts. Regardless, this time of peace after the fight against Asma would last for two years. In total, this means that it has now been five years since the 23rd World Martial Arts Tournament. Out in the field, a strange UFO crash landed, which caused a nearby farmer to go and investigate. Once he arrived, he seen that there was a space pod as an alien and exited it. Then once he tried to shoot this stranger, the bullet was grabbed and flicked back at the farmer, thus killing him. He then took off flying, as a scouter picked up on a high power level nearby. Piccolo was currently out in the wastelands training when he sensed someone coming towards him. Once this creature lands, he still mentions that Piccolo is 
no match for him, so Piccolo tries to blast him. This leaves him unscathed, and as he was about to attack Piccolo, his scouter picked up on other power levels. So, he took off towards them, as he was searching for someone named Kakarot. Meanwhile, at Kalanai House, Roshi and Asmu were visiting Krillin. Bulma then arrived and brought tea cakes as a present for them. After briefly catching up with them, they are interrupted by the arrival of Goku, Chi Chi, and Gohan. Since they've already met Gohan at the last tournament, none of them would be surprised about Goku having a kid. Instead, Goku would be the one that's surprised this time around, since when he hears about Krillin being the new leader of the Turtle School, that would be a shock to him, as he never expected Roshi to pass it on. So, Roshi would explain to them how he chose to pass it on so that he could become the Guardian of Earth. After some small talk, Goku interrupts it as he notices the power level coming towards them. This is when the alien from earlier arrives at Kame House, though he then begins talking about someone named Kakarot and how they were supposed to eliminate the Earthlings. They didn't know what he was talking about, so Krillin tried to get him to leave, which is when the alien then used his tail to send Krillin flying into Kame House. Goku still tries to ask the stranger who he is, and after he asks if Goku damaged his head, Roshi explains to him the story that Grandpa Gohan told him about Goku entering his head. This alien then mentions that they are alien warriors called Sans, and that he is Goku's older brother, Raditz. It is hard to explain that Goku's birth name is Kakarot, along with explaining what the Saiyans did and how they would transform during a full moon, which is when he realizes that Goku no longer has a tail. He then goes on to explain how their home planet was destroyed by an asteroid, and he says that he was there to get Goku's help with taking over a planet. This is also when he mentions that including Goku, there are only four Saiyans left. Raditz then noticed Gohan hiding behind Chi Chi, and since he has a tail, he figured out he is Goku's son. As he mentioned he was going to borrow Gohan, Goku threatened him not to come any closer. He didn't need Gohan in the stomach and grabbed Gohan, before telling Goku that if he wants to see his son alive, he will have to kill a hundred humans by tomorrow. While this was going on, Piccolo was behind Kame House, listening in on what Raditz was telling all of them. Raditz then took off with Gohan, leaving the heroes behind to figure out what to do. Goku then tried calling for the flying Nimbus, but Roshi stopped him from flying off alone and without a plan. Once they start to Discussing a plan, Goku mentions that his tail would be his weakness, so they will use that to beat him. They then use the Dragon Radar to find his location since Gohan had the Dragon Ball on his hat. This is when Piccolo reveals himself, as he says that they don't have a chance against Raditz. When he suggests joining up with Goku to fight Raditz, he agrees to. However, Chi Chi, Roshi, Asma, and Krillin tell him that they are going as well. Since Gohan was taken in this angered Chi Chi, she decided to try her best in this fight as well. Krillin decided to go help since he didn't want to disappoint Roshi, especially after he was just chosen to be Roshi's successor. Something to mention is that Roshi probably would have had to swallow his pride and learn how to fly while training with Kami, so that he could get around the world faster. So, when they all prepare to go after Raditz, he doesn't have a problem flying with them. This would be a good time to mention how strong they are. Roshi and Asmo are equal in power, to them having a power level of 370 when wearing their weighted clothing, and 480 when they aren't wearing their weighted clothing. Goku and Piccolo's power levels were the same as normal, with them being 334 and 322 when weighted, and 416 and 408 without the weights, respectively. And Krillin's would be 206 and Chi Chi's is 148. Meanwhile, when Raditz arrives back at his pod, he throws Gohan into it since he wouldn't stop crying. He then starts to notice a growing power level coming from his pod, but he is interrupted when the scouter picks up and everyone coming to take him on. Once they arrive, Goku, Piccolo, Asma, and Roshi quickly take their weighted clothing off. Together, they would have a combined power level of 2138. Raditz would still start the fight off by using his speed to individually hit them. The strategy does catch him off guard at first, but it doesn't work for long against them. When they team up, up against Raditz, it would be hard for him to take them on, as he would be overwhelmed since he was getting attacked by six different people. However, it wouldn't all be smooth sailing for the heroes, since in the brief gaps Raditz gets, he would use his strength to knock Roshi and Asma away. Then while they were knocked away and recovering, he would be able to beat down the others. Then when he tries using his double Sunday, they just barely manage to dodge it, and in the confusion of dodging it, he would hit Krillin away. As usual, one of Piccolo's arms was also blown off by this, regardless, of some of them recovering, Raditz would start beating down on the others. During this time, Piccolo would have been trying to use a special beam cannon, but Raditz finding Chi Chi and Goku would be distracting him at first, though his scouter would pick up on this, allowing him to dodge it, but just barely. However, it might have hit his arm even more than it did in the actual series since he was being attacked by two people. While it is gory to mention, old Dragon Ball was like that at times, but he would probably be missing part of his arm because of this. As he then went to finish them off, Goku grabbed his tail, so Piccolo started to charge another special beam cannon. The Raditz still tricks Goku into letting go by saying he'll leave this world if he does. Once he lets go, he starts to knock Goku around, 
down. Though he is struggling more because of the injury he received to his arm earlier, though as he is beating Goku down, an enraged Gohan breaks out of the Saiyan pod as he then headbutts Raditz in the chest. Before Gohan could run, Raditz was trying to attack Gohan, but Chi Chi blasted him in the back to give time for Gohan to run away. Before he could finish off Chi Chi, this is when the others got back up, so they would start their joint attack on Raditz again. With his sustained injuries starting to wear him down, they can start landing more hits on him. Though the Saiyan would still get some hits in, his hits are losing power as time goes on. Eventually, Raditz would get to a point where he could no longer move, like how Vegeta was in the Saiyan Saga. Goku would try to argue for sparing him, but the decision would probably fall onto Roshi's shoulders since he is now the Guardian of Earth. With him seeing how Raditz tried to kill them, along with trying to kill a child, Roshi wouldn't take the chance on sparing him. So, who uses Kamehameha to mortally wound the now crippled Saiyan? However, before he dies, he would still mention how this information has been transmitted to his two partners in the depths of space, and that they will come there now, and they are even stronger than he is. After they ask how long it will take for them to get there, Raditz says it will take one year. The Goku and the others would say something along the lines of them being able to train and take them on. Raditz would laugh about this, so they wouldn't realize how outclassed they are, but he then passed away. In the depths of space, the two Saiyans would be discussing if they should go to Earth. Without them knowing about the Dragon Balls in this timeline, they wouldn't have as much motivation to go there. However, with Goku mentioning that he and the others could get strong enough to take them on, the Saiyans might take this as a challenge. Regardless, it would at least give them something interesting to do, so they took over the last planet they were on easily. They also discussed the power of Gohan, since so the chance of someone else rivaling their power, let alone a hybrid, is also motivation for them to kill the Earthlings. So, they decided to head off towards Earth, as they didn't went to sleep for the trip there. Back on Earth, they were discussing how Raditz was able to find them so easily, which is when Piccolo points out the scouter he was wearing. While Bulma was messing with the scouter, the heroes discussed what they were going to do. Roshi was suggested they should go up to the lookout to train with himself and Kami. The heroes would agree to this, but when it comes to Piccolo, he would be reluctant to do that. He was interested in Gohan's power, but he didn't want to see his other half, let alone get help from him. The Roshi might be able to convince him that since he is there as a guardian now, he wouldn't have to deal with Kami. Also, since he can't just take Gohan and leave since Chi Chi and Goku are there to stop him, he reluctantly agrees. Before they go to the lookout, they would gather Yamcha, Tien, Shatu, and Yajirobe to train as well. Once they all arrive, Roshi's promise to Piccolo would not last long, since Kami had other plans. He decided to take both Roshi and Goku to Otherworld to train with King Kai. Before they go, Roshi would convince Kami to allow Asma to go as well, since he has started down his own path of training good, and spending more time with himself and Goku likely would help him out more. After they go to Otherworld, Kami would convince King Yama to allow them to go train with King Kai. So, after they are driven to Snake Way, Roshi, Asma, and Goku would begin running it. Back on the lookout, the heroes would start training as per usual, except Chi Chi and Gohan would be training with them. Piccolo would have tried training with them, but since they were having to follow Kami's instructions, he was easily getting fed up with it. It got to the point that he would stay on the other side of the lookout and train by himself. Eventually, Gohan would have noticed him, and he would have tried to talk to Piccolo, since he thought he needed a friend. Of course, Piccolo would still have his cold exterior at first, but eventually he would get used to the young boy coming around, so they would start training training together, though, Piccolo would eventually get completely fed up with Kami's training and decide to leave the lookout. Without telling Chi Chi, Gohan tried to sneak away and leave with Piccolo to train, but she would have noticed this. However, since Chi Chi isn't as strict in this timeline, she's more willing to let Gohan do what he wants to do. However, that doesn't mean she's just going to let Piccolo run off with Gohan. They can only go train together on the condition that she goes with them as well. He would reluctantly agree to this condition, since Piccolo wanted to help draw out the boy's power. When they start training, Piccolo would still be harsh in his methods, which Chi Chi would disagree with this. They would bicker on how to train Gohan, Piccolo's side might win out. Since he would mention with what he knows about Goku, his training started off with him being alone in the wilderness. Piccolo then goes to prove to both Gohan and Chi Chi that the boy can handle it, as he then throws him at a mountain, which Gohan's rage allows him to blow it up. Chi Chi would still be reluctant, but with Gohan saying he'd be fine doing it this way since it is like how his dad trained, she reluctantly allows this. Now that Piccolo has convinced Chi Chi to let Gohan stay in the wilderness to train, Piccolo's first task for him is to survive in the wilderness for six months, as he and Chi Chi then take off. Up on the lookout, Kami would be watching this, as he notices that Piccolo has changed somewhat, though he is still evil, but his crude violence he had before is gone. He would also mention that maybe this change happened because Piccolo realized both his and Kami's life will end in a year. Back with Gohan, he's chased by a dinosaur, so he jumps onto a mountain to escape it, though he ends up stuck on top of the mountain as well. He eventually falls asleep, but when he wakes up, there are apples Piccolo and Chi Chi left for him, though Piccolo swears this is the last time he'll help. When Gohan wakes up again to use the bathroom, he ends up looking at the 
full moon, causing him to turn into a great ape. This would shock both Piccolo and Chi Chi's Gohan begins destroying everything, but Piccolo would remember what Raditz said about the full moon allowing Saiyans to use her true power. So, Piccolo then blows up the moon, which causes Gohan to revert to his normal self. Even though Chi Chi protested it, Piccolo then removed Gohan's tail, but he also made him a new outfit. After that, Piccolo leaves Gohan there, as he and Chi Chi go off to train together for the next six months. Six months later, Piccolo begins training Gohan for real, so Chi Chi helps train him as well. Of course, when it is Chi Chi training him, her training wouldn't be as harsh as Piccolo's, but because of both training Gohan, his fighting style would be like a combination of Piccolo's and Chi Chi's. Back in other world, Goku, Roshi, and Asma reached the end of Snake Way, so they had to jump up to King Kai's planet. Since Roshi met King Kai before, the scene of Goku thinking Bubbles was King Kai wouldn't happen. King Kai would agree to train them, but on the condition that they make him laugh, which they would be able to, but Asma struggles the most with this part. After he agrees to train them, they realize that they can barely move here, which is when he mentions the gravity of this planet being 10 times Earth's gravity. He makes their first test to catch Bubbles, but they try to take off their way to clothing to catch him, but King Kai made them put it back on since it would be better training. All of them eventually catch Bubbles, so King Kai allows them to begin their training. Back on the lookout, Kami had nothing else to teach the heroes, so he had them return to the Earth to refine their skills before the Saiyans arrived. Back with Piccolo, Chi-Chi, and Gohan, the young boy became less of a crybaby, and he started to gain control of his energy. Then back on King Kai's planet, something important might have happened with Roshi and Asmo. Asmo being around Goku, Roshi, and a deity like King Kai would have helped him continue his path of becoming good. The main thing they had to work on was his lustful side, so King Kai likely could have put a training regimen together that would help him get over this. After all, they are in Otherworld, there must be some female souls around to ensure his training helped Asmo get over these feelings. After he does get over them, they might conclude that Roshi and Asmo should merge back into one being, since they both are pure of heart now. I don't know if them merging would work the same as Kami and Piccolo merging back together, but but King Kai will likely know some kind of technique that they could use to merge, since their power was halved when they split, Roshi's power will double when they merge. Anyway, Goku and Roshi both would have been taught a spirit bomb in the Kaioken. Though as usual, King Kai realizes he didn't factor in the time of traveling Snake Way, and by the time they reach Earth, it'll be too late, but they still start to head there as fast as they can. Before I get into the fight with the Saiyans, I'm quickly going to mention the power levels of all the fighters. Since Chi Chi, Gohan, and Piccolo left the lookout early on, the Earthlings' powers would be the same as they usually are, so Tien, Yamcha, Krillin, Shotsu, and Yajirobe have a power level of 1,830, 1,480, 1,770, 610, 970 respectively. Then as for Piccolo, Chi Chi, and Gohan, their power levels would be 3,900, 3,400, and 2,900 respectively. Roshi and Asmo both would have had a power level of 3,700, but since they merged, Roshi's power level would be 7,400. Finally, since Goku had both Roshi and Asmo to train with, his power level would be higher than normal, as his power level is now 9,000. The next Next day, the two Saiyans landed in East City, which the heroes on Earth sensed right away. Though, Nappa then destroyed the city, but Vegeta scolded them for this, since it damages the resale value of the planet. Regardless, Vegeta then used the Scouter to search for the highest power levels, which he spotted three high powers next to each other. Since they were going straight towards Piccolo, Chi Chi, and Gohan, the three heroes take off towards Paprika Wasteland. After they arrive, Krillin is the next one to show up, as he, Gohan, and Chi Chi then make small talk. However, Piccolo cuts them off, as Vegeta and Nappa then arrive and land in front of them. After they start talking, with Piccolo, they would reveal that he's in the Mechian, but they wouldn't bring up the Dragon Balls if they don't know about them. Up on the lookout, Kami realizes he's an alien as well, and mentions to Mr. Popo how he has an ancestral memory of someone on his home planet making Dragon Balls. Regardless, back on the battlefield, Vegeta and Nappa would remove their scouters, so they realize the heroes can suppress their power. Vegeta then has Nappa plant the seven seeds for the Cybermen, but before they can attack, the and Shotsu arrive. After they arrive, Yamcha is the next one to show up, which works out well since there are seven of them and seven of the Cybermen. Vegeta proposes they each fight one at a time, so Tien decides to step up first. Saiyan's body would lose, but Tien managed to beat down the Cybermen with ease. As this Cyberman tries to get back up, Vegeta easily kills it, since it was already beaten. Yamcha steps up next, as he goes blow for blow with one of the Cybermen. When it tries to grab him, he appears behind it and uses his Kamehameha to send it into the ground. It was he lands to take on the other five, the one he was just fighting gets up and grabs onto him. It then self-destructs, and after the smoke clears, Krillin goes to check his body, only to reveal that Yamcha died. Out of anger, Krillin uses is a scattering bull to try and take out the other five Cybermen in the sands. Though he missed one of the Cybermen, but when it tries to attack, Piccolo grabs his arm and throws it into the sky, as he kills it with a mouth blast. The Saiyans had come out of the skate, as Nappa asks Vegeta if he can take all six on, which Vegeta allows him to. As he starts to power up, the ground begins to shake, so Shotsu tries to use his telekinesis powers on Nappa, but it doesn't affect him. Nappa starts with attacking Tien, but when he tries to block him, he punches off part of Tien's arm. He then tried killing Tien, but he jumped out of the way, though he was quickly knocked into the ground. 
Krillin tried to charge at Nappa, but he was easily blown back by Nappa's exploding wave. At first, Shotsu was nowhere to be found after this, but he is then seen grabbing onto Nappa's back. After using his telepathy to say goodbye to Tien, he self-destructs to take out Nappa. However, once the smoke cleared, Nappa was still floating there, relatively unscathed. The heroes then come up with a plan to attack Nappa the moment he tries to attack, since he leaves himself open. Vegeta hears this as sarcastically tells Piccolo it's a good plan, and that he hopes it works, but he should focus on Nappa, or he'll miss his chance. So, when Nappa tries to attack Tien, Piccolo punches him away. Krillin then hits him towards Chi-Chi, which he hits him towards Gohan. But Gohan checked it out and didn't blast him, so Chi-Chi, Krillin, and Piccolo tried to instead, but Nappa dodged their blasts. To try and defend Shotsu, Tien uses his spirit tribeam against Nappa, which only damages his armor. Tien then falls to the ground, as he dies as well, which causes Krillin to scream out for Goku and Roshi to hurry and help them. Nappa decided to let Piccolo live for a little longer, so he decides to target Krillin next. However, up on the lookout, Kali tells Mr. Popa that he feels that he only has a little time left, as Piccolo is about to die. As they decide to return to the ground, since they think Nappa is accustomed to fighting in the air, he starts to charge at them. However, Vegeta tells him to stop, as he wants to ask them something. He didn't ask if it's Goku they kept mentioning is Kakarot, now they're finding out it is, he says they will wait for three hours. Unfortunately for the heroes, after the three hours pass, Goku and Roshi still aren't there. Nappa then removes his armor as he prepares to finish them off. So Piccolo comes up with a plan that Krillin will get his attention. He will grab his tail, then Chi-Chi and Gohan will hit him with all they've got. Krillin then charges at him and blasts the ground before going into the air, which distracts Nappa as Piccolo then grabs his tail. While Chi-Chi and Gohan are rushing in, Nappa calls them fools as he then elbows Piccolo in the head, knocking him out cold. Vegeta then asks him if they really thought they wouldn't have gotten over the weakness of their tails. Nappa decides to go after Gohan next, since he was curious what Kakarot's son could do. He then kicks Gohan away and then swats him into a nearby mountain. Gohan then struggled to his feet, but before Nappa could hit him again, he is attacked by an enraged Chi-Chi. She started unleashing her own assault on Nappa. With her power having risen since Gohan being hurt angered her, he is caught off guard at first, but he soon gains his ground, as he then sends her flying as well. He then tries chasing after her, but Krillin kicks him in the head and punches him away. When he tries to follow up for another attack, Nappa tries retaliating, but Krillin manages to dodge it. Nappa then tries attacking him again, but Krillin Krillin charges the destructive disc, so he tries to take it head on. However, Vegeta warns him to duck, so it only manages to cut his cheek. Nappa then tried blasting him, but he dodged it, though the shockwave hit him. As he then went to finish Krillin off, he was blasted in the back by Piccolo. Normally, at this time, Piccolo would sense Goku coming, but he still wasn't on Earth yet. Of another world, Goku was going slower than usual, so that Roshi could keep up with him. Even though they were close in power, Roshi's old age would still be catching up with him for running that far. Roshi's also new to flying, so it would drain his power faster than it drains Goku's, which only slows him down even more. Regardless, back on Earth, an angered Gohan charged at Nappa and kicked him in the jaw. This sent him flying into a mountain, which then collapsed, but he flew out of the rubble madder than ever. He then fires his bomber DX at Gohan, which both Piccolo and Chi Chi tried to jump in the way of to shield the young boy. The Piccolo ended up in front of both Chi Chi and Gohan, so he takes the brunt of the blast. The barely standing Piccolo then tells both to run. As he then collapses, Gohan, of course, still tried to tell Piccolo the hold on, as Piccolo then called it pathetic that he died saving a woman and child. After he says that they were really the only ones to talk to him, and that the time they spent together wasn't so bad, he passes away. Up on the lookout, Kami said he could die pleased now that Piccolo finally surpassed him, as he then passes away. Back at the battlefield, Nanger, Chi Chi, and Gohan turn their attention towards Nappa, as Gohan uses his Masanko, and she uses a stronger version of her Maiden's Will Blast, which I guess I'll call it Matron's Will, so she's a matron instead of a maiden now. Nappa would manage to knock away their blasts, but they scathe him more than what Gohan's did alone. Before Nappa could retire, retaliate, Chi-Chi charges at him in a last ditch effort, since if she fails, Gohan will be hurt more, or worse, killed. Though with her being worn out from using that last blast, her attacks aren't doing much to him. Eventually, he will get bored of her attempts to attack him, so he unleashes his own assault on her. However, since he is still angered, when he goes to kill her off, he would do it in a brutal way, by punching a hole through her chest. As she slumps to the ground, dead, Gohan looks on in disbelief. Though his disbelief soon turns to anger, as his anger rises higher than ever before. He would likely be crying out of both sadness and rage, but his power level doubles to 5800. Since Nappa wasn't using his full power, his power level was only at 4000, so he was being beaten back by Gohan. Around this time, Goku and Roshi arrive at King Yama's check-in station, but since Kami is dead, it's likely Mr. Popa would be the one to transport them back to the lookout. We have never seen Mr. Popa do this, so it's unknown if he can, but since in the manga Kami told Mr. Popa he was leaving things to him after he died, I'm assuming he can. Regardless, once they arrive back on Earth, they quickly leave the lookout. On their way down, they get two sensu beans from Korin, which they eat right away so that they go back to their full power. Goku then calls for the flying Nimbus, 
So they both used to get to the battlefield so that they can save their energy. Back at the battlefield, Gohan got distracted from his assault as he picked up on Goku's power level coming towards them. Vegeta used the scouter to confirm this, and after seeing that Goku has a power level of 5600 and there being a power level of 4600 with him, he tells Nappa to hurry and kill Gohan and Krillin. Together their power levels might be trouble for them, and he thinks seeing their corpses might shake Goku up. So Nappa goes into his full power of 7500 as he starts to pound Gohan into the ground. Eventually, the young boy shakily rises to his feet as he apologizes to Chi Chi and Piccolo for not being able to defeat them. As Gohan collapses to the ground again, Nappa walks up to him as he prepares to crush him with his foot. Since Goku is still about a couple minutes away, Nappa does crush him, killing the young boy. Krillin watches this in disbelief, though as this quickly turns to anger, it allows him to shakily rise to his feet. He then uses the solar flare, which temporarily blinds Nappa and Vegeta. Since they can't see, he would use his chance to stall for time, as he starts to knock Nappa around. He then uses the Kamehameha's power with his life force, as he then fires it at Nappa, which once it hits the Saiyan, it sends dust flying in the process. Before Krillin can tell if it works, he collapses to the ground, as he used the last of his energy, so he died as well. Once the dust clears and Nappa has regained his eyesight, he would be disappointed to see that Krillin died too, since that was the last of the heroes left before Goku arrived. Which, Goku and Roshi arrived just in time to see Krillin collapse, as they look on in shock to see that all their other friends are dead as well. However, Goku would be affected by this even more than usual, since not only did he see his best friend die, but his wife and son are dead as well. The ground will start shaking beneath Goku's feet, as his scene started to crumble beneath him, with lightning starting to strike around him and rocks floating into the air. His head started to jerk back. This is when Nappa would ask about his power level, which Vegeta would use his scouter to see that it is 9,000 are rising, as he then crushes his scouter. Goku's hair started to spike up and it started changing between black and yellow, as the others watched on in confusion. However, Vegeta might realize that he's becoming the Super Saiyan of Legend, so he would order Nappa to blast him. Vegeta uses his Gallic Gun and Nappa uses his Bomber DX to try and blast Goku, but when the dust clears, Goku is standing there unscathed. His hair is now spiked up and solid yellow in color, while his eyes are a piercing greenish blue in color. As a Super Saiyan, this would have brought Goku's power level up to 450,000. Vegeta still tries to play this off as him being the strongest Saiyan ever, but Nappa then tries to attack Goku. However, since Roshi would sense that Vegeta is the stronger of the two, he steps in the way so that Goku can take on Vegeta instead. After Roshi knocks Nappa away, Roshi and Goku would lead them to Gizan Wasteland so that they don't kill anything during their fight. Once there, Roshi and Nappa would begin fighting, but these two are close in power, and Nappa is ever so slightly stronger than Roshi, so the two would be going blow for blow with each other, but Roshi would be receiving slightly more hits than he was landing. At the same time their fight begins, Vegeta would try talking to Goku, but he's quickly cut off with a punch to the jaw. Goku was in no mood for talking, as he started to pummel Vegeta easily. Vegeta's max power level was 18,000, so he wouldn't stand a chance against Goku, who wouldn't even be able to land any hits on Goku, as he would be outclassed in both speed and strength. Back with Roshi and Nappa, Roshi would resort to using the Kaioken, which brings his power level up to 14,800. As he starts knocking Nappa around, he ends up hitting him in the back hard enough to cripple him. However, unlike Goku in the actual series, Roshi wouldn't spare him, since he killed all their friends. So, he uses his Kamehameha, which easily kills the crippled Nappa. With Nappa now dead, Roshi would drop out of the Kaioken as he then turns his attention towards Vegeta, though he would quickly realize that Goku doesn't need his help in fighting Vegeta. Vegeta would be in a brief state of shock that Nappa was killed, but he couldn't focus on that as Goku was still pummeling him. When Vegeta does get the chance to escape, out of desperation he would rise into the air and begin to charge his Gallic Gun. In return, Goku would begin charging his Kamehameha as well. Once they both fire their blast, they would meet in the middle briefly. However, Goku's blast would easily overpower the Saiyan Prince's blast. With the Kamehameha overtaking the Gallic Gun, it would slam into the Saiyan Prince, sending him up into space. However, he would be vaporized by this blast, thus ending the Saiyan invasion of Earth. Because of the strain of the Super Saiyan form, Goku then collapses to the ground and reverts to his base form. With the Saiyans now defeated, Roshi would help Goku up as they briefly celebrate their victory. This celebration doesn't last for long, though, as they realize they must revive their friends. Before they leave, Yajirobe would come out of hiding as he goes with them to help gather the bodies of the heroes. After they retrieve their bodies, they take them to the lookout so that they aren't laying down there while they gather the Dragon Balls. Since Kami transferred the Guardianship to Roshi, the Dragon Balls are now tied to his life instead of Kami's, so the Dragon Balls are still around. Anyway, Bulma already had the Dragon Balls gathered in case they needed them after the fight with the Saiyans. So, they would go get her and the Dragon Balls before returning to the lookout. Once there, they would wish for everyone killed by the Saiyans to be revived. Of course, this would revive everyone, except Krillin and Shotsu, as they had died once before. This is when they would begin discussing what to do about Krillin and Shotsu, which is when Mr. Popo 
Sakura mentions something. She talks about how Kami said he had an ancestral memory of there being Dragon Balls on his home planet. If they can find his home planet, Namek, they might be able to use their Dragon Balls to wish Krill and Shotsu back. The heroes would then begin discussing this plan, as they would have to find where Namek is and then find a way to get there. While the heroes were on the lookout planning how to get to Namek, they would have thought about using the Saiyans as spaceships. Though, assuming Roshi had a TV put on the lookout, they would have seen the broadcast about the scientists having collected both spaceships. Since in this timeline the remotes for these ships were destroyed when the Saiyans were killed, they can't use these ships. However, this talk of spaceships would remind Kami and Mr. Popo that there is something they think might be a spaceship that they can use. That when Mr. Popo asked someone to come with him, they suggest how Bulma should go, and she would be the best one to figure out how to use the spaceship. After she agrees, he uses his magic carpet to take them to Yunzabit Heights. Once they get to the object that he thinks is a spaceship, he explains the story of Kami telling him about how he grew up in Yunzabit Heights. Then after they enter it, Mr. Popo would reveal he knows the Mechian. Since the ship is commanded by voice, they try testing if it works, which it does. They then return to the lookout and explain that it was a spaceship, and they can leave in five days. If they revamp the ship a little, Bulma would want someone to go with her, which as usual, Roshi would volunteer. Normally, Bulma shot this suggestion down, but since Roshi no longer has his preferred side and is the Guardian of Earth, she would agree to this. Since Roshi is going with them, Kami and Popo would decide to stay on Earth. Even though Kami wanted to see his homeworld, someone needs to keep an eye on the Earth. When Gohan eventually says he wants to go, since he wanted to help revive Krillin, Chi Chi allows him to this time, but she decides to go with them too. They were worried about the spaceship getting crowded, so unfortunately for Goku, he couldn't go with them. Before they leave, they would have to find out where planet Namek is, so they can get in contact with King Kai. Roshi would talk to him telepathically. This is when King Kai would explain to them where Namek is in the history of the planet. Regardless, after the five days passed, Bulma, Chi Chi, Roshi, and Gohan would board the ship together. While on the way to Namek, Roshi likely would have decided to do image training, which Chi Chi would join in. Gohan would join in too, but Roshi would also help teach Gohan in the ways of the Turtle School. At least, teaching him the ways of the Turtle School as much as he can, since he can't have Gohan do the exercises he had Krillin and Goku do, such as delivering milk or farm work. Something important to talk about here is Frieza, and what he would be up to, since the Earthlings never mentioned the Dragon Ball Serratids, as Goku wasn't killed, Vegeta never found out about them, and since Vegeta didn't know about them, he didn't get the idea to go to Namek for the Dragon Balls, which means that Frieza couldn't have overheard this on his scouter, so he would have no reason to go to Namek. It's possible Frieza could have gotten curious about what happened to Raditz, Nappa, and Vegeta, I don't think he would care. Sure, the Saiyans were useful to them, but he would have gotten rid of them eventually, so whoever defeated them just saved him the time of having to do it himself. Anyway, once the heroes eventually reached Namek, they are going to have a much easier time collecting the Dragon Balls than they normally did. So, once they get to Namek, the heroes will quickly land, but Bulma will make sure the atmosphere is breathable before they exit the ship. Once outside of the ship, Bulma will check the Dragon Radar, which it does pick up on the Namekian Dragon Balls. Gohan then notices that there are high power levels on the way towards them, so they put their guard up. The high power levels he sensed turns out to be some of the warrior Namekians, as they came to investigate who this was on their planet. The four heroes will quickly explain who they were and why they were there, with them saying everything about the fight with the Saiyans and how they were there to revive their friends. After hearing this, the warrior and the Mechians would be more peaceful to them, but they would be a little skeptical at first. They would tell them that they will have to go see the Grand Elder Guru to get permission to use the Dragon Balls. Of course, once they arrive at where the Grand Elder is, Nail would come out to talk to them. Both the heroes and warrior and the Mechians would explain why they are there, so Nail would allow them to see the Grand Elder. This is when the warrior and the Mechians take their leave, so the heroes enter the Grand Elder's house alongside Nail. Once there, Gohan would try explaining their story, but he would stop him and ask him to come next to him. After he does, he places his hand on his head and reads his past, which allows him to see that their intention is pure. So, it would allow the four of them to use the Dragon Balls. Before they go, however, he would decide to unlock their hidden potential, which, for Gohan, Roshi, and Chi Chi, he would unlock their hidden power. Then when he unlocks Bulma's potential, this would unlock more of her intelligence instead of her latent power. Regardless, after their potential is unlocked, they would prepare to go and gather the Dragon Balls, but there being three of them that can fly, they would be able to split up to gather them even faster, so they would all look at the radar and decide who would go where. After they get the first three, they would bring them back to the Grand Elder's house. They would then repeat the process to get the next three, and once they returned to the Grand Elder again, he would give them the seventh Dragon Ball. With the help of Nail, they would summon Puranga, but this is when they find out that they can only revive one person at a time, but they have three wishes. They would use the first wish to revive Krillin, which Nail would repeat this to Puranga. The second wish would then be used to revive Shotsu, so Nail tells Puranga their second wish as well. And as for the third wish, they don't have one, so Nail would dismiss the dragon. After thanking the Namekians for their help in reviving their friends, they would prepare to go back to Earth. Just like they did on the way there, Roshi, Chi Chi, and Gohan would trade in the same way on the way back. After they returned to Earth, 
The heroes would all meet up at Castle Corporation within an hour by its crew on the Shotsu. They would likely have a party in celebration of defeating the Sands, since the Earth is now in a time of peace. Since Goku normally got a gravity training chamber put in a spaceship to go to Namek, and he didn't get to in this timeline, he might go to Castle Corporation and ask Bulma and Dr. Brief to build a gravity chamber for him. They would likely agree, so they would expand his house and include this gravity chamber. Also, since it is built and Chi-Chi still trains in this timeline, she might train inside of it with Goku as well. Piccolo also comes over to visit and train with Gohan and Chi-Chi, so he might end up training inside it with Goku and Chi-Chi too. While Gohan could train there, he'd probably choose not to on purpose. Even though Chi-Chi isn't forcing him to study as much, he would choose to study on his own since he wants to be a scholar. This doesn't mean he isn't training at all though, he just isn't training as much as they did before in preparation for the Saiyans. Since he started training with Roshi on the spaceship, he might go through the full turtle school training now that he's back on Earth. Regardless, the Earth will now be in a time of peace for just under two years. With Vegeta not being alive, he would never have been there to stay on Earth, so he can never get in the way of Bulma and Yamcha's relationship. Sure, Yamcha Yamcha was to have problems with infidelity, but with her not being distracted by Vegeta, they would be able to work through these problems together and develop a healthier relationship. Anyway, after these two years have passed, everyone would be together at Castle Corporation just to hang out together. Since the heroes never fought Frieza, he wouldn't be coming back to Earth as Mecha Frieza for his revenge. While they were hanging out, a mysterious person would arrive, saying that he was looking for Goku. He wouldn't say what his name was, and when Bolin noticed the Capsule Corporation logo on his jacket, he asked if he was one of their employees. Regardless, Goku would step up and talk to him, but the mysterious person has him go somewhere farther away so it's private. When they get far enough away, he would start with having Goku spar with him, so that he could test his power. However, he wouldn't have Goku go into his Super Saiyan form, since this warrior isn't able to. After they spar, he goes on to say not to tell the others what he is about to say, which after Goku agrees. He goes on to say that he is from the future and his name is Trunks. Though when he says that his parents are Bulma and Yamcha, that wouldn't be a surprise to him. Regardless, he goes on to warn them that three years from now, two androids will attack. He also explains that they were created by the Red Ribbon Army and how he's the only fighter left. After saying that all the heroes die in the fight against the androids, he explains how Goku caught a heart virus and died before they attacked. Though he then gives Goku medicine for the heart virus and tells him to take it when the symptoms appear. He then has Goku promise again to keep it a secret since he might not be born otherwise. Trunks says goodbye as Goku returns to the others, but he has trouble explaining things. So, since Piccolo heard it all, he offers to explain it, so Goku allows him to. They then see the time machine leaving as Trunks waves goodbye and the heroes make their plan to train. Roshi would plan to go train with King Kai again, so he would suggest that the other humans should Come with him to train. They would likely accept, so it would be Roshi, Chi-Chi, Gohan, Tien, Yamcha, Krillin, and Shotsu going to train on King Kai's planet. Goku would stay behind to train in his gravity chamber, with Piccolo deciding to train with him as well. With Roshi on King Kai's planet, he would quickly realize that he didn't have much else to learn from the Kai. While he could teach the other humans the Kaioken, he already taught this to Roshi, along with the Spirit Bomb. Instead, he might suggest that Roshi should go and train with the Grand Kai. While we don't know any techniques that the Grand Kai teaches, I think he could help with something important, which would be gaining control over the Kaioken. Ken. While Roshi didn't really have to deal with the negative side effects of the Kaioken, if he didn't use it a lot, he would still know that they exist. So, with the help of Grand Kai, he would work on trying to master this technique. So, over the next three years, the heroes continued training in preparation for the arrival of the androids. As a brief break from the main timeline, I'm going to discuss the future timeline, which, in all honesty, besides some minor changes, not a lot would be different. There are just some important details to discuss so that I can explain why the future is still in a terrible state in this timeline. Anyway, the branching off point for this timeline is after the heroes return to Earth from Namek. With the Earth being peaceful, they still have a celebration at Castle Corporation since they defeated the Saiyans. Though, when they are hanging out at Castle Corporation two years later, they aren't interrupted by a mysterious individual. So, after they finish hanging out, the heroes go their separate ways. Another two years later, in age 766, Goku catches a heart virus. They would have tried to give him all the medical attention possible, but even the doctors in Bulma weren't able to find a cure in time. So, later that year, everyone was gathered at Goku's house. Gohan was currently running back to his house, but when he arrived and went inside, Chi-Chi told him the unfortunate news that Goku passed away. Krillin passes this news on to the other heroes, which leaves him in a state of shock, though his passing was merely just foreshadowing for the tragedies to come. Six months later, a mysterious duo would begin their attack on a Menbo Island. The heroes would hear a news broadcast about this attack, so they would all go to fight this mysterious duo, which they turned out to be androids. Since Roshi is the guardian of Earth in this timeline, he wouldn't just stand aside and watch this, but he would go with the heroes as well. Also, since Chi-Chi is still a fighter in this timeline, she would also go to help them. Regardless, Piccolo is the first one to step up to the androids. However, after a swift kick to the chest from Android 18, Piccolo is killed. Up on the lookout, Kami would die as well since his life is attached to Piccolo's, but the Dragon Balls would still be around since they are now connected to Roshi's life. Back with the heroes, Vegeta would try to take on the androids, but he's kicked 
kicks so hard in the stomach when Android 17 and he dies too. Roshi is the next one to step up, but his attacks would be futile against the mechanical menaces. Even when he tries using the Kaioken, which he is pushed to using the Kaioken times 20, he still can't harm them. Before they could finish him off, he would collapse and die from the strain that the Kaioken times 20 had on his old body. Then Chi Chi tries to fight them, but she was supposed to be killed with a blast through the chest by 18. Yamcha then tried to attack 17, but he was killed by a powerful kick to the neck. Tian is the next to die, after he receives a swift punch to the stomach by 18. Krillin is then killed as both androids shoot him in the head with a blast. Shotsu is next, as he is killed after being punched in the gut by 17. Finally, Yajirobe is the last one to seemingly be killed, as 18 blasts him through the gut. This is when Korn would arrive after the androids left to give Sensu Beans to the heroes, but it is too late, as all of them are dead, except for Yajirobe, so he is saved. Yajirobe is then taken to Korn's tower, so this means that the only other hero that survived was Gohan, though he doesn't know Yajirobe survived. Bulma's son Trunks also survived, but he is just an infant at this time, so he can't do anything as of now. Though this is also where this timeline doesn't change a lot from the regular future timeline, Timeline, since it is just Gohan and Trunks left. Something else to mention is that normally there wouldn't be anything stopping them from going to Namek in a situation like this. After all, Namek was never destroyed, so it's still where they know it to be. They even still have Kami's old spaceship to be able to go there. So, for this to work, I had to come up with a way to stop them from going to Namek. While it's not the best solution, the current solution I have is that when the androids eventually attacked West City, Kami's spaceship would have been destroyed. Since Bolin then likely had it in Castle Corporation's yard, it would have been out in the open when the androids attacked so it would be destroyed. Of course, Bolin would try working on repairing it, but it might be difficult with it having been blasted to smithereens. Eventually, when she gets the idea to build a time machine, she would give up on rebuilding the spaceship and would start building the time machine instead. After all, with the spaceship, even if the heroes were revived, the androids would likely kill them again. With her building a time machine, this gives them a chance to change the past. Like I said, this isn't a perfect solution, but it is the one I could think of. Regardless, 13 years passed, as Gohan would have started training after the heroes died. He also would have unlocked the Super Saiyan transformation after witnessing the death of the heroes, though he also would have started to train Trunks when he was old enough to train. Since Trunks is a full-blooded human in this timeline, Gohan would just be training him to get stronger and to learn how to fight, as he obviously couldn't become a Super Saiyan as well. The rest of this part will basically skim over the events, as not a lot would change from what normally happened. One day, while they were training, the androids began to attack Superworld. At Superworld, the androids would team up on Gohan, so Trunks would try to help him. This would force Gohan to try and rescue him from death, though he loses his left arm in the process. So to rescue him from death again, Gohan had to give Trunks the last sensu beam. Trunks then took Gohan back to Castle Corporation and after he recovered, their training was Resumed. But this training is eventually cut short again when the androids attack Peppertown. Trunks begged to go with Gohan, but he knocked the young boy unconscious and went on his own. Despite his handicap, Gohan puts up a long fight, but he is eventually killed by the androids. This is when Trunks awakens, and he finds his mentor dead, which sends him into a fit of rage. Though, he eventually returns home after he manages to calm down, but he breaks the news to Bulma. Three years later, Bulma was still working on the time machine, with Trunks helping her. But when they are interrupted by a radio broadcast about Bridgetown being attacked, Trunks ignores Bulma's pleas and takes off. Without being able to go Super Saiyan, he's completely outclassed against the mechanical menaces. Though after he is defeated, they only decide to spare him so that they can continue to have someone to toy around with. He is then knocked unconscious, but when he wakes up, He's back in his house with Bulma by his side. After a brief talk, he decides to take the time machine, but as of right now he must recover. After the time machine is finished and he recovers, she gives him the heart medicine to take to Goku. She then wishes him good luck as he takes the time machine and goes to the past. Three years after they were warned about the androids, Goku, Gohan, Chi Chi, and Piccolo started to head towards the Menbo Island. On the way there, they met up with Roshi and Krillin. As they then landed on the mountains of the island, Tien, Yamcha, and Bulma were already there, though she was holding a baby. Though before Bulma could mention his name, Goku would let his name slip. She questioned him about how he knew Trunks' name, though he just jokes and says he's psychic. Though Yandrobi then shows up and gives them sensor beans, as he then takes off. Though his ship is shot down when he leaves, as they didn't see the androids going down into the city. This shocks the heroes if they didn't feel any key, but Gohan says that because they're androids, they wouldn't have any key. Regardless, they then turn their attention towards the city, as they prepare to chase half of the androids. As the heroes go into the city, Goku has Gohan leave to go help out Yajirobe since he is still alive. In the city, Android 19 ends up attacking someone and throwing them into a building, while Android 20 rips someone out of their car and kills them. This causes an onlooker to scream, which Yamcha notices, so he races off towards it. The androids thought this was Goku, but when he arrives, they quickly realize it is Yamcha. As usual, 20 ends up grabbing Yamcha and starts to drain his power. However, since he knows the Kaioken, he would briefly use the Kaioken times 20. This catches 20 off guard, as he then breaks out of his grip by kicking him away. This increase in power alerts the other heroes, so they all rush in to come to Yamcha's aid. After arriving, Piccolo mentions that these are the androids, which shocks the two androids, as they don't know how the heroes know all this. Goku refused to tell them, as he then insisted that they should fight somewhere deserted, so 20 then destroyed the city. This angers Goku enough to rush in, as he then punches 20 away. 
away. He then tells them to follow him, which the androids agree that when they mention Goku's name, the heroes are shocked about how the androids knew who they were. They say that they know who all of them are, but regardless, they all take off to go somewhere deserted. But since Yamcha is with them, he warns them about the androids being able to absorb their energy through their hands. Back with Gohan, he takes off to join the heroes, while Yajirobe stays behind. At first, Bulma berates him for this, until he reveals to her that he can't fly, so she apologizes. When the heroes eventually reach a plane surrounded by mountains, 20 stops Goku and says that this is far enough. Before they started fighting, Goku got 20 to explain how he knew about them, but Tien also noticed that Goku was out of breath already. When 20 explains about how he knew about them, Piccolo mentions that he is talking like he is Dr. Jiro himself. Something to mention is that the androids would be stronger than usual since Dr. Jiro knew about Super Saiyan in this timeline. However, the heroes are also stronger than usual since they all trained harder than usual. While Goku wouldn't have mastered Super Saiyan, he would have better control over it when compared to the actual timeline. The point is, their power levels would probably be similar in scaling to the original both sides are just stronger. Anyway, Goku then turned into a Super Saiyan form as he charged at 19. Their fight goes about the same as usual, with the two going blow for blow with each other. After Gohan arrives at the battlefield, Piccolo asks if he noticed it too, which is when he explains that Goku is rushing this battle for some reason, as he is already using his full power. Even though they knew about the possibility that they can absorb energy, Yamcha wasn't completely sure, so Goku still fired to come at 19, which he absorbed it. Shockingly for the heroes, Goku was already tired out, as 19 then charged at him. This time, 19 was easily beating him down, so Goku tried to use the Kamehameha again, but Piccolo yelled for him not to before he could fire it. Goku eventually clutches his chest as the heart virus began to take effect, so Krillin tossed him a sensu bean. The sensu bean didn't work, and when they wonder why Goku was getting sick, Gohan reveals he didn't take the medicine since he was healthy over the last three years. Regardless, he eventually falls out of his Super Saiyan form, so 19 pins him down by his neck and starts to drain his energy. This is when all the heroes try to rush in, but 20 gets in their way. Piccolo would step up to attack him but 20 shot him through the chest with lasers from his eyes. Since there's no Vegeta to kick away 19, Piccolo's plan of his defeat being a distraction would work. Roshi, using his Master Kaioken, would rush in to kick 19 away while 20 was distracted. After 19 is kicked away, Piccolo would get back up since his distraction worked. As he explains to Gohan what his plan was, regardless, Roshi then tosses Goku over to Piccolo, but he gives him the Chi Chi. After Piccolo advises her to take the medicine too in case it's contagious, she takes him home. 20 then stops 19 from chasing after Goku, as he decides that they should take on the others first. 19 then has to take on Roshi, which 20 allows, but he says he gets to face the other 5 in return. As they prepared to fight, Roshi would push his master Kaioken to a level the heroes haven't used before, which is Kaioken times 50. This level of Kaioken would put his strength on the level of the Super Saiyan, so when 19 rushes at him and punches him, his attack wouldn't do much. Instead, when Roshi starts to attack 19, he would easily be knocking him around. After getting knocked down, 19 would rush back at him, but Roshi would be dodging his attacks while hitting him in return, though he eventually gets grabbed by 19 on purpose, so that he can rip off his hands in a similar way that Vegeta did. This shocks the others, but as 19 tries to flee, Roshi would use his Kamehameha to destroy him. As he returns to the ground, he drops out of his Kaioken, since 19 absorbed all his energy. Though he would still stand his ground against 20 by saying that this would be his chance to attack him as he's out of energy, but 20 flees into the nearby mountains. Roshi then gets the Sensu Beam, but instead of immediately chasing after 20 alone, the heroes would go together to find them. While the heroes were looking for him, 20 decided to go after Piccolo next, so he grabbed him from behind and started to drain his energy. So, he would telepathically contact Gohan to come help him, so he rushes in and knocks 20 away. The others didn't show up. As Krillin gives Piccolo a sensu beam, he then takes off his weighted clothing and starts to beat down 20, which shocks the other heroes. However, since Piccolo is stronger than normal, his attacks would be doing more damage to him than usual. Meanwhile, Future Trunks arrived at a Menbo Island, and when he sensed the heroes' his key, he took off towards them. When he arrives, he sees 19's head, which confuses him as these aren't the androids he knows. Regardless, Bowman Yaja Yajirobe would start heading towards the battlefield as well. The Yajirobe tried to talk her out of it. Back with Piccolo and 20, since he is stronger than normal, he would have been able to slice off both of 20's hands. Trunks would then arrive, which as he asks who they are fighting, they say these are the androids. His revelation of these not being the androids he knows shocks the heroes, but when Bulma and Yajirobe arrives, 20 wouldn't be able to blast her ship down as he doesn't have his hands anymore. So, this wouldn't distract the heroes from him, so Piccolo decides to go back to fighting 20. It would be at even more of a disadvantage against Piccolo, so he would be getting pummeled into the ground. After knocking the android around for a while, he would use his Hellzone grenade to blast 20 into smithereens. 
Bulma and Yajirobe were then land, and she mentions that the old android they fought looked like Dr. Jiro. After talking with Bulma some more, they get Trunks to explain what the androids he fought looks like. Afterwards, they ask Bulma if she knew where Jiro's lab is, which she says it's in the mountains by North City. Briefly off topic, this is normally where Bulma finds out that Trunks is her son after he chased after Vegeta. Even though that scene wouldn't happen in this timeline, she would still probably figure out that he is her son since they were calling him Trunks and her baby resembles him. Anyway, all of them would head here to look for the lab, with Trunks helping fly Bulma there. With 20 being destroyed, it would take a while to find it, but they would be able to find it. Once they do find the lab, they don't know the code to get in and they wouldn't be able to just break through the door, so Piccolo blasted it down for them. Once in the lab, they would find the three pods containing androids 16, 17, and 18. Once seeing inside the pods, Trunks would say that 17 and 18 are the androids he fought, but he has never seen androids 16 before, though he would suggest that they should destroy the androids while they are still in the pods. However, since Bulma is with them, she might have a different suggestion. After seeing the blueprints for the androids scattered around the labs in combination with her higher intelligence, since Guru unlocked her potential, she comes up with an idea. She would come up with the idea to reprogram the androids so that they are good instead of evil. Trunks would likely protest this, but he might be able to be convinced to allow this since these versions of the androids haven't done anything wrong yet. So, after being convinced, with the help of Trunks and Yamcha, they would take the three pods containing the androids to Castle Corporation. She would also gather the blueprints she could find related to the three androids and take them with her. The rest of the heroes would discuss what to do now, but since the android threat was seemingly stopped before it could even begin, they would decide to go up to the Kami's lookout together at first to discuss their next plans. While there, they discuss how long they think it would take Goku to recover, which they estimated it would take 10 days at least. Back at Goku's house, Chi Chi finally found the heart medicine, so she gave it to Goku and took some herself just in case it was contagious. Then at Castle Corporation, Bulma and Dr. Brief would be working together on trying to reprogram the androids. Though with 17 and 18, they would quickly find out that the two were originally humans that were turned into androids. So, when they start trying to reprogram them, they wouldn't mess with their personality like Dr. Jiro did. Instead, they would just work on removing any malicious coding in them that said to target and kill Goku. The two of them would also work on removing the bombs from the androids. The same would go with 16, but unlike in the original where Bulma couldn't get 16 to completely get over his desire to kill Goku, she might be able to this time. Since her intelligence was improved when her potential was unlocked, she would be able to use this intelligence to completely remove the malicious parts of the programming from Android 16's code. So, his personality would mostly be the same. He would just no longer have the desire to kill Goku. Anyway, while they were working on reprogramming the androids, they would be interrupted as Bulma received a report from one of her employees. After receiving this, she would call up to Roshi on the lookout and ask if Trunks was there. And when she started talking to him, she would explain how a farmer found a machine out in the wild with a Castle Corporation logo on it. She had him send a picture over, and it turned out to be a destroyed version of Trunks' time machine, which he says that he has his time machine in a capsule, so she faxes a picture of it over to them, and it is indeed his time machine, so this shocks Trunks. After Future Trunks gets the location of the time machine, he decides to go see it, and Gohan asks to go too, which he allows. Bulma also heads there, so she and Dr. Brief put a pause in their project of reprogramming the androids. Once all three arrive, they check out the time machine, which it looks like something blasted its way out from the inside. They also find the eggshell on the side of it, as well as figuring out that this time machine left the future years after Chunks did the first time, but it also arrived here before he came to the past the first time. Up on the lookout, even though he isn't the Guardian anymore, Kami would be watching their investigation of the time machine. After mentioning that he felt uneasiness for the last four years because of that time machine, he fills both Piccolo and Roshi in on his worries that they are about to face a creature that is far more powerful than the androids would have been. Back with Bulma, Chunks, and Gohan, Trunks reverts both time machines into capsules, though before they leave, Gohan finds a giant insect molt, which they figure that whatever molted the shell must have been what was in the egg in the time machine. Though Trunks also realizes that it hasn't been that long since the cicada-looking bug exited the shell. Regardless, Bulma would then head back to Castle Corporation, while Trunks and Gohan go back to the lookout. Though before they leave, Bulma says that she'll call them if anything happens. Back on the lookout, Kami would be watching what was happening on Earth, as he then asks, what is that thing? A confused Piccolo and Roshi would ask what he is talking about and ask if it has to do with this time machine he has been talking about. Then back with Bulma, who is currently on her ship, she would hear the news report about all the inhabitants of Ginger Town suddenly vanishing. After hearing this, she would realize that that was right where the time machine was. So, she would call Roshi again and tell them to watch the TV so that they could see the broadcast about Ginger Town. While they are watching it, Trunks and Gohan arrive, but the transmission cuts out when the reporter is attacked by an unknown creature. Then with Kami and Piccolo, Kami they finally decided to merge back into one with Piccolo. After saying goodbye to Mr. Popo and Roshi, the two would merge, as Piccolo then left the lookout. Trunks also decided to go and check out what was going on, while the others stayed behind. Anyway, when Piccolo arrives in Gingertown, the freak of nature approaches him. 
at the time. The creature was holding the richest man in Gingertown, so Piccolo told the creature to let him go. This creature seemingly listened, but it then absorbed the man through his tail after letting him go. It then tells Piccolo that he is next, which he was shocked that the creature knew his name. Regardless, the creature then powers up, as they are shocked to feel the key of Goku, Piccolo, Yamcha, and all the others emanating from this one creature. Regardless, the creature then refers to him as Piccolo again, but he says that he has the wrong person, as he then powers up as well. Back with Trunks, when he left to go investigate this, Krillin went with him as well. Anyway, back with Piccolo, since this creature killed everyone in the town, Piccolo decides not to hold back. As mentioned before, the androids were stronger than usual since Jerome knew about Super Saiyan. By extension, this would mean that this creature is stronger than normal as well. The heroes also are stronger from their more intense training, so like in the fight with Jero, the scaling between the two is like the scaling between them in the actual series. They would be fighting blow for blow, but this creature would say that Piccolo isn't bad, but he also isn't in his perfect form. Piccolo then had him explain who sent him back in the time machine, which is when he reveals he sent himself. After using the Kamehameha, the creature grabs Piccolo from behind and drained his arm. Piccolo then seemingly gives up, as he has the creature explain who he is before absorbing him. He says that he is named Cell, that he was made by Dr. Jiro, and that he was made from the cells of all the heroes. After he points out the spy robot of Jiro's, Piccolo blasts it. The Cell then reveals that he was made beneath Jiro's lab, so this timeline Cell would still be there too. After revealing that he needed to absorb 17 and 18 to become perfect, Piccolo rips off his withered arm and regrows it, since he was tricking Cell that he was defeated just to get him to talk. The Cell does find out Piccolo merged with Kami, they are interrupted by the arrival of Trunks and Krillin. Piccolo then warns them to watch out for its tail, but as they were discussing the creature, Krillin let it slip that Goku is alive, which shocks Cell. He then vows to absorb the androids, as he uses the solar flare and escapes. Piccolo tried to chase after it, but it hit its key so that it couldn't be found. Afterwards, the others wanted Piccolo to explain who Cell was, though he waited until after some of the other heroes arrived, like Roshi, Yamcha, and Tien, which Piccolo then fills them in on who Cell is and how he was created. Though, this time, their plan isn't to kill the androids, it's just to kill Cell. The heroes then decide to split up to look around, with Piccolo, Tien, and Roshi staying there. This means that Krillin, Trunks, and Yamcha are the ones to go and explore the lab. They do find the sub lab, and this time lands Cell in it, but without Bulma there to offer to reprogram it, Trunks destroys his version of Cell. They then destroy the entire sub lab as well, but Trunks does gather some blueprints he thinks would help Bulma before they did. The two then head to Castle Corporation, while in the meantime, Piccolo, Roshi, and Tien continue their search for Cell. Though any time they notice his key, he has already hidden himself by the time they arrive where they sensed it. Three days later, at Goku's house, Chi Chi found that Goku has finally woke up and recovered from the heart virus. As usual, Goku decides to go train in the hyperbolic time chamber, but since Chi Chi still fights as well, she goes with him. They would then go and meet up with all the heroes, as they were currently in the process of trying to find Cell. He would then fill them in on their plan, so they go up to the lookout together. Normally, Goku would plan on going first, but this time Roshi might ask Goku if he could go first. His reasoning for wanting to go first is that he is the Guardian of Earth, so he should be the one to try and take on Cell. Goku would be fine with this, but they must decide who would go in with him. Every one of them could have been a good option, but I think Roshi would decide on taking Trunks in with him. He knows that Trunks wants to defeat the androids of his timeline, so this training could be helpful to Trunks. Also, Roshi would be able to teach Trunks to Kaioken, so the two go in together. The next day, while some of the heroes were at Kame House, they of course wouldn't be approached by the androids. Instead, they might be approached by Cell since he would have absorbed enough people to help him grow in strength. He also would have tried to search Jiro's lab for the androids, but with the state of the lab, he likely assumed they were destroyed, since they weren't active. He even tried finding his time machine to go back in time again, but since Trunks took it, he had no luck. Currently, it would be Piccolo, Krillin, Yamcha, and Tien at Kame House, so Piccolo steps up to take on Cell. He'd start immediately with removing his weighted clothing, but he would lead Cell to an uninhabited island before they start the fight. While they are close in power, Cell would have the slight advantage, but Piccolo would be landing good hits of his own. Back at Kame House, the other heroes would decide to fly in and help Piccolo, so Yamcha, Krillin, and Tien all take off towards them. Back with Piccolo, since he was getting beaten down more than Cell, his power would start to drop, so he wouldn't be landing as many hits, if any. Though he would try to use an energy spear against Cell, but the creature takes takes the blast head on and comes out unscathed. Cell then punches Piccolo away, breaking his neck, before then lifting him up and blasting him through the chest, as he then throws Piccolo into the water. While Cell is doing this, he would be briefly caught off guard as he is hit by Tien, Yamcha, and Krillin, who are using the Kaioken x20. Normally, these three wouldn't be able to do much to Cell, but with the Kaioken at their disposal, they have a better chance. They wouldn't be doing a lot of damage to the creature, they would just be making it hard for Cell to get hit soon, since right after he is hit by one of the three, he is hit by another, and then the third hero, which this cycle continues. 
that the second one and the last rare since Yamcha would eventually be the first one to drop out of the Kaioken form, as his body could no longer handle the strain. Cell would take this moment to knock Yamcha away, before turning his attention to Krillin and Tien. Without Yamcha there to help, the two wouldn't be able to stall Cell like they were previously. However, Tien would ask Krillin to stall Cell momentarily, as he had an idea. Krillin would agree, which he tried his best to stall Cell, but he had to push his Kaioken above 20 times to do so. Tien would then rise above Cell, and shout for Krillin to get out of the way, as he fired the Neo Tri-Beam at Cell. Normally, this can hold semi-perfect Cell in place, but he wasn't taking damage. With Cell being in his imperfect form, and Tien having the Kaioken, he might damage Cell, but only slightly. Though Tien would have to limit how much he used the Kaioken, since the strain of it combined with the strain of the Neo Tri-Beam could be fatal to him. He would be able to hold Cell off for longer, which gives enough time for Roshi and Trunks to exit the Hyperbolic Time Chamber, which Goku and Gohan are the next ones to go in the Time Chamber, while Roshi and Trunks leave right away, so that they could try and rescue Tien. On the way there, Roshi would make a quick stop at Kame House so that he could grab something. Anyway, when they arrive, Roshi would have Tien stop using the Tri-Beam so that he doesn't use all his energy. Unlike Vegeta and Trunks, Roshi and Trunks would attack Cell together, with them both using the Kaioken as well, though only Roshi has the mastered version. They wouldn't have given him the chance to recover from Tien's onslaught, so they would be knocking Cell around together. Since Tien didn't use all his energy, he would join in as well, though he probably couldn't push his Kaioken too high in his state. Regardless, Roshi would have an idea of his own to stop Cell, so he would have Trunks and Tien hold him off. Krillin would join in too, since he was still there, so the three would be distracting Cell for Roshi. In the background, Roshi would put a jar on the ground, as that is what he grabbed from Kame House. He would then start to use the evil containment wave, as he yells for the others to get out of the way. Once he fires it, they wait until the last second to move, so that Cell doesn't see it coming. We've seen Roshi steal away stronger fighters than him in the Tournament of Power, so he would be able to steal Imperfect Cell away here. If he had to, he would use the Kaioken to help trap Cell, but he would only use him in short bursts. Even though he mastered the Kaioken, he worried about combining the two, since both can be stressful on the body. After Cell is trapped in the jar, he would quickly put the cork in it so that he can't escape. The other heroes would come over, a little shocked that Roshi had managed to use the evil containment wave and survive, since when he last used it, he died. Though he was in rough shape, as he was worn out, but then again all of them were worn out from this. Regardless, he would pick up the jar, as they then went to the lookout together. They would fill all the other heroes in on what happened, minus Goku and Gohan, since they were in the time chamber currently. Anyway, with Cell now imprisoned, Roshi would lock the jar up inside of the lookout, so that Cell would never be released. The heroes would then go get the Dragon Radar from Bulma, as they then split up together the Dragon Balls. Once they are gathered in Nacelle and Shenron, they only have one wish this time, which is to revive all the people that were killed by Cell and the androids since 19 and 20 did kill some people. Afterwards, even though they don't have to train, the remaining heroes would likely train in the time chamber as well. For Trunks' second day, he would likely choose to go in with Yamcha so that he could spend time with his father. And as for Roshi, he would go in with Krillin for a second day so that he could test how the new Turtle Hermit is coming along. Now, Krillin would then use his second day of training to go into the chamber with Yamcha just so that they could spar together for old time's sake. This leaves Goku and Gohan who have only gone in once, and Tien, Piccolo, and Chi Chi who haven't gone in at all. Goku and Gohan would likely use their second days to train with Chi Chi, with Goku and Chi Chi going in first and then Gohan and Chi Chi going in. This leaves Piccolo and Tien as the remaining two, so they would use their two days in the chamber together. After they all finished training, everyone would gather at Castle Corporation to celebrate the defeat of Cell. By this point, Bulma and Dr. Brief managed to reprogram the androids, so they would be there too. Though, this is also where Trunks would say his goodbyes, as he prepared to return to the future. As he left, all the heroes waved goodbye to him, so he waved goodbye as well. Though, before I get into the future part of the timeline, it came to my attention that I made a mistake in the video about the future. I accidentally said that Vegeta was alive in it, even though he would have been killed by Goku. So, as a correction of that, just ignore the part where I mentioned Vegeta's fight with the androids. Anyway, when Trunks arrives back in the future, he would explain everything that happened in the past to his mom. They are eventually interrupted by a broadcast about the androids attacking Parsley City. Since Trunks learned the Kaioken in the past, and even how to master it, he took off to fight the androids. When he arrives, 18 was destroying the place since she lost the video game, but his arrival interrupts them. And she was annoyed. She tried to blast and kill him, but he would go into his mastered Kaioken state and deflect it. He then used the blast of his own against her, destroying her in the process, which shocked Seventeen. Regardless, he then knocked Seventeen away and blasted him to smithereens as well. After dropping to his regular form, he then returned home and let Bulma know that he defeated the androids. Three years later, he was going to go to the pass and let everyone know that the androids were defeated, but Cell was there watching him. Chunks called him out, as he knew he was there. Cell revealed himself. After talking briefly, he revealed that he defeated the androids, which shocked Cell. 
Regardless, he then knocks Cell away from the time machine and out into the wilderness once there. He went back into his mastered Tomkin state as Cell tried to use a Kamehameha, though he quickly finished off Cell with his heat death attack as he then dropped to his base form. He then returned to Castle Corporation and let Bulma know that the world was in a time of peace once and for all. With Cell sealed away, the heroes were able to go back to living in a time of peace. Up on the lookout, this gives Master Roshi the time to rest and fulfill his duties as Guardian of Earth without having to worry about a known upcoming threat. He hasn't been able to relax like that since the years between when he fought Asmo and before Raditz came to Earth. Even though there isn't a known upcoming threat, that doesn't mean that Roshi is going to slack off on his training. He has seen time and time again that another threat always appears, so he would keep training in preparation for that day. As for the other heroes, what they get up to during this time might be different than what we're used to. Starting with Krillin, he still would have been the new Turtle Hermit, and he might have started taking on students of his own. Though, with his personal life, even though the scene of him destroying the remote to save 18 wouldn't have happened, he would get with her. This time, however, the main thing that makes 18 come around to see Krillin as her hearing about them helping convince Future Trunks to spare and reprogram her. So, eventually, Krillin and 18 would have gotten married and lived at Kame House together, along with having Marin as well. Speaking of the androids, 16 and 17 would have gone off to become park rangers together, since they both enjoy nature. Regardless, with Krillin now being the turtle hermit and taking on students of his own, this would have inspired the other Earthlings. Normally, Tien doesn't start the new crane school until years later, but with Krillin now having his own school, this would inspire Tien to start his earlier. Of course, Shotsu would help Tien with starting the new crane school, so the two of them would be instructors there. Then with Yamcha, Krillin and Tien both having a school combined with him still training would fuel his own desire to start a martial arts school. However, since his fighting style is a combination of the turtle school style and his old bandit fighting style, he would have to come up with a name for his school, which, what better name than the Wolf School, since his signature technique is the Wolf Fang Fist. Then in his personal life, he'd be a much more involved parent to Trunks than Vegeta ever was, so Yamcha, Bulma, and Trunks would be more like a normal family. Anyway, another fighter that might start a martial arts school is Goku himself. He never considered doing this, but after Krillin, Yamcha, and Tien started their own, they tried convincing him to start his own as well. To convince him, they would propose that they could have fighting competitions to see whose school is better. With there being a chance of Goku getting a good fight out of this, of course he would agree. Since Goku's fighting style is a combination of his past teachers, he would call his school something else, which, as a callback to when they used to think he was just a monkey boy, he would call his school the monkey school. As for Chi Chi, since she still fights, I can see what she chooses to do going two different ways. She would either choose to be an instructor at Goku's school, or she could start a school of her own, which I chose for her to go for the second option, since I think her and Goku having a friendly rivalry between their schools would be interesting to see. As for what she would name her school, it's easy. She would name it the Ox School, since her father is the Ox King. Speaking of Goku and Chi Chi, they likely still would have had Goten not long after the fight with Cell, which Goten would have been trained by Goku and Chi Chi when he was old enough to be trained, so he would be stronger than the Goten we know. Then not only would he be stronger, but Gohan would be stronger than normal too. Since Goku is still around, he wouldn't let Gohan completely fall behind on his training, though he would still do the things he wants to do with becoming a scholar, so he likely finds a good balance between training and studying, at least for now. Only time will tell if that balance between the two lasts forever. Anyway, another Earthling that might start a school is Piccolo. Now, he would be unlikely to voluntarily do this. However, Chi Chi would likely rope him into doing it, since she has a close relationship with him in this timeline. Now, as for what he could name his school, it was harder to come up with something for it. What first popped in my mind would have been Demon School, as a callback to when he and King Piccolo were considered demons. But because of him being merged with Kami, I didn't think it was a good fit. So, to go with the animal theme I've been following, and as a good tie-in to his Namekian heritage in the Dragon Balls, I chose to call his school the Dragon School. While he would eventually take students, he would still like to be alone a lot, so he wouldn't take nearly as many as the other heroes. Early on, he likely just trained with Gohan and claimed him as one of his students. Regardless, with the Earth still being in a time of peace like this, the heroes would still get together at times and hang out at Castle Corporation. They would also get together for the competitions to see whose school was doing better by having their students compete against each other, though they also might go against each other in these competitions, but they might still have Goku hold back from using Super Saiyan. They might just restrict themselves to their base forms or to using the Kaioken technique so that it could be a fair fight. No matter who wins these competitions, they would still congratulate each other before going back to relaxing and hanging out together. Seven years after Cell was defeated, the Earth is still in a time of peace. We open on Gohan, as he is on his way to his new high school in Orange City. Since Hercule was never given the credit of defeating Cell, Orange City wasn't renamed to Satan City. It doesn't mean Hercule isn't popular though, since he still is the World Martial Arts Champion. He has some popularity. He just isn't as popular as he normally would be since he isn't seen as the hero of Earth. Anyway, 
Anyway, when Gohan arrives in Orange City, he notices an ongoing robbery, so he returns to his Super Saiyan and then easily stop the robbers. After he reverts to his base form, he's confronted by a girl asking what happened, he claims he didn't see it. Though an onlooker says that it was Golden Warrior and that he wore a badge of the Orange Star High School, which she also goes to. Later in class, when Gohan arrives, Erasa still invites him to sit by her, so she would still introduce him to Videl and mention that her dad is Hercule. After they started talking, Videl would recognize him from being there at the robbery and mention how the Golden Warrior was wearing the same outfit. But since he isn't blonde and he looks weak, she doesn't think he is the Golden Warrior. Regardless, they eventually find out where Gohan is from, which shocks him since they were 5 hours away by plane. Later, when they go to play baseball in gym class, Gohan tries to make himself look bad so he doesn't draw attention to himself. Though to catch the ball, he ends up jumping way farther in the air than the normal person can. Anyway, after school, Videl tried following Gohan, but he jumped onto the top of a building to avoid her, before taking the flying Nimbus to go see Bulma. He only wanted to see her so that he could ask her for help in getting a disguise for himself. After arriving at Castle Corporation, Bulma agreed to make him the disguise. While she was making it, he went and talked with Yamcha and Trunks, but they went back to training shortly afterwards. Regardless, after getting the suit, he thanks Bulma and leaves. He decided to test out wearing it as he had been challenged with flying Nimbus to a race, but while they were flying over Orange City, he's seen people speeding. He tried stopping them and introduced himself as the Great Saiyan Man, but they thought he was joking. And once he stomped the hole into the road out of annoyance, they left. The next day, when they were in class, Gohan noticed Videl leaving early, so he asked Erasa about it. After she explained that she helps the police, Gohan still worried that she was getting in over her head, so he decided to follow her. After changing into his Great Sandman outfit, he took off and caught up to her. She was beating down the one robber, but when one tried to shoot her from behind, Gohan arrived and knocked a gun out of his hands. He then introduces himself as the Great Sandman, so he calls Videl by name and says to handcuff them, so she realizes that he's Gohan. Regardless, the robbers try to flee, but Gohan easily flies after them and catches them. After they were caught, Videl tricked him into revealing his identity by asking how he snuck out of class, which he answered her without thinking. On their way back to school, she asked him if he was going to join the upcoming World Martial Arts Tournament, but he said no. Something to mention is that since the World Martial Arts Tournament still happened every 3 years in this timeline, that means the upcoming tournament is the 29th World Martial Arts Tournament. Hercule has been the champion of the 27th and 28th tournaments, which helped lead to his popularity. Anyway, she would still realize that Gohan was the son of the previous champion Goku, so she would think it would be interesting to see the current champion's daughter go against the previous champion's son in the tournament. Though she also blackmails him that if he doesn't join, she will reveal his identity, so he reluctantly agrees to join the tournament. Anyway, they decide to return to class separately, but before Gohan changes back to his normal outfit, she also forces him to teach her how to fly. After class, Gohan goes back to Castle Corporation to get something to replace the helmet, since it can't be worn in the tournament. The Volmo just ends up giving him sunglasses and a bandana. Anyway, when Yamcha overhears that Gohan is entering the tournament, he decides to enter as well, for old time's sake. Regardless, he then returns home, which is when he tells Goku and Chi Chi about joining the upcoming tournament. Of course, the two of them would decide to join as well, and they would suggest that Gohan should go tell Roshi, and Tien so that they'll join as well. He goes to Kame House first, and Krillin agrees to join, though 18 also joins after she hears about the prize money. Next, he goes to the lookout, where he tells both Roshi and Piccolo about the tournament, so they join as well. Lastly, he would go to Tien's martial arts school and tell both him and Shotsu, so they agree to join too. The next day, the scene of Gohan helping Goten train when it happened, since Goten was already trained by Goku and Gohan over the years. This also means that it wouldn't be a shock to him if Goten already unlocked Super Saiyan. Regardless, the bell would arrive, so Gohan Gohan would begin his training of teaching her how to fly. After the end of their first day of training, he suggests that she should cut her hair short so that it doesn't get in the way. This angers her and she leaves, but she still shows up the next day with short hair. Anyway, all the heroes would start to train in preparation for the tournament, though Hercule didn't train for it, as he was arrogant enough to think he had this tournament in the bag. When the day of the tournament arrived, everyone went to it together, though Goku, Gohan, and Goten all agreed not to go Super Saiyan so that the other heroes could have a chance. Though, they also might limit themselves to not using the Kaioken either, just to make it more interesting. Once everyone arrives, they meet up with Piccolo there, so he chose to go there separately. After talking briefly, they all go register for the tournament, The Goten and Trunks were made to join the youth division. Before the preliminary started, an interviewer tried to talk to Goku and the others, but Piccolo destroyed their cameras. Eventually, the announcer spots Goku and the others and tells him how glad he was to see them, as the tournament has become boring without them. Regardless, 16 of them will go on to the finals, though one of the spots is already taken by Hercule, 
skill, so only 15 of them can advance. They must use the punch machines, and those with the highest scores will advance to the main tournament. Hercule Soul comes out to demonstrate that when spectators start using their cameras, Halo destroys them all again so that Gohan's identity stays a secret from people at his school. Anyway, after Hercule does his demonstration, the other heroes use the punch machine, with all of them achieving scores higher than Hercules. The tournament that begins with the youth division, though it goes the same as it normally does up until the finals. Both Goten and Trunks will get through their matches with ease, so there isn't any reason to go into detail about them. Their fight would go about the same as usual, with the two being close in power, and instead of Trunks being the one with a slight advantage in power, Goten would have the slight advantage. He only has this advantage since he is half Saiyan while this version of Trunks is a full human. So, while the match was close, it would end with Goten just barely managing to knock Trunks out of the ring. Now that Goten won, he gets to face Hercule, so Hercule enters the ring. Anyway, Hercule still throws off his cape and starts to warm up. Then when Goten gets ready, he tries to fake that an old injury of his was acting up, but it didn't work. When they begin to fight, Hercule lets Goten get the first hit, so he is easily knocked out of the ring. However, he gets back up and places off his head letting Goten win, which the audience believes him. Anyway, the heroes then head towards the contestant area so that they can draw lots to see what the matches are. But this is also where they found out that Piccolo entered his name as Ma Jr., since Piccolo would cause a panic. The fighters that passed the preliminary in this timeline are different, since there were more of the heroes participating than normal. This would mean that Mighty Mask isn't in the tournament, so the scene of Goten and Trunks stealing his outfit to be in the adult division wouldn't happen. Regardless, before they go to draw lots, they see a mysterious duo there. They recognize Goku, but he didn't know them. That when asked, they just say that they've heard about him. Piccolo realizes that they aren't from Earth, but anyway, the lottery began, so they stopped thinking about it. After they all drew lots, the matches ended up as follows. Match 1 is Krillin vs. Shotsu. Match 2 is Shin vs. Ma Jr. Match 3 is Videl vs. Spopovich. Match 4 is Kabito vs. Great Saiyan Man. Match 5 is Hercule vs. 18. Match 6 is Goku vs. Chi-Chi. Match 7 is Tien vs. Yamcha. And Match 8 is Yamu vs. Master Roshi. After they head to the waiting room, both Krillin and Shotsu enter the ring. This fight would be like their fight from the 22nd World March Lords tournament. Though Krillin wouldn't use math-related tricks to distract Shotsu, the Shotsu would still use his telekinesis against Krillin, he would eventually be able to break out of this and knock Shotsu out of the ring. Then for the second match, both Shin and Piccolo would enter the ring, but when Piccolo was wondering to himself about who this was, Shin read his mind. He told him that he'll find out and that he should just enjoy the game for now. However, Halo forfeits the match because he senses who Shin is. The next match is between Videl and Spavovich, so they both enter the ring. On the sidelines, Roshi likely would have noticed something about Shin as well. So, when Piccolo goes to talk to him, Roshi would tag along. After asking if he is the Grand Kai, Roshi would be able to say Shin isn't as he trained with the Grand Kai, so Kabita reveals that Shin is the Supreme Kai, which shocks them both. After his identity was revealed, Shin asks him to keep his identity hidden. Regardless, Videl's fight against Spavovich would go the same way, with her beating him down at first, but she is soon beaten down instead. However, Yamu stops her from continuing to beat her around, so he kicks her out of the ring. Gohan helps Videl up while Roshi used the Kai Kai to go to Korin's tower and get a sensu beam. While there, Korin warns him to keep on his toes, as he has a bad feeling about this. After he returns, he gives the beam to Gohan, and Gohan gives it to Videl, thus healing her. The next fight is between Kabito and Gohan, though as he enters the ring, his classmates that were in the stands recognize him, so he dishes his disguise, but Kabito then asks him to turn Super Saiyan. Piccolo and Roshi yell at the Gohan and nod the signal that they should transform, so Gohan complies and begins to transform. Shin also tells the heroes that no matter what happens, they need to stay put. Gohan decided to go past Super Saiyan and show off what he and Goku unlocked through their training over the last seven years. Years. So, he turns into a Super Saiyan 2, which shocks the others, as this is their first time seeing it. Yamu and Spavovich then tried attacking him to drain his energy, so Shin used his telekinesis to hold Gohan in place. After draining his energy, Gohan reverted to his base form while Yamu and Spavovich took off. Shin would take off after them, while Kabito stayed behind to heal Gohan. Without Vegeta being around to stop Goku, he, Chi Chi, and Piccolo would leave right away. Roshi, Yamcha, Tien, and Shotsu would go with him as well, while Krillin wanted to tell 18 first before he left. 18 decided to stay at the tournament since there was no money in chasing after Spavovich and Yamu. Anyway, Kabito then healed Gohan as they then took off together. The Videl went along with them so that she could learn what was going on. Then with Goku and Shin, he went on to explain that the real threat is Bobbity, as he is trying to resurrect Majin Buu. With Kabito, Gohan, and Videl, Kabito would explain the same things about Bobbity and Buu to them. Gohan still advises Videl to turn around, but before she leaves, 
She asks if he was the Golden Warrior, which she says yeah. As Gohan and Kabito kept flying away, Videl promised to ask out Gohan if he would come back safe. Regardless, Gohan and Kabito eventually catch up with Shin and the others as they all land and suppress their teeth. While spying on Bobbity's ship, they see it open as two people come out of it. Bobbity and Deborah exit the ship, with Deborah being there as a shock to Shin, as he then explains to the others that Deborah is the king of the demon realm. Anyway, Spopovich and Yamu give the energy they took from Gohan to Bobbity, and in return the warlock causes Spopovich to explode. Yamu then tries to flee, but Pui Pui blasts and kills him. Afterwards, Bobbity and Deborah realize the heroes were there, so Bobbity left Deborah to handle them while he and Pui Pui returned to the ship. So, Deborah then charged towards them, which is when they realized that Deborah knew where they were. After rushing in, Deborah would blast Kabito at point-blank range, killing him. He then used his spit on Krill and the Piccolo, turning them both into stone. Deborah then returned to Bobbity's ship, while Goku, Gohan, and Roshi chased after him, despite Shin's protest, but he still followed them. The other heroes stayed behind in case anything happened outside the ship and so they could ensure nothing happened to Piccolo and Krillin. Once inside, the exit locks behind them, as Shin lets them know they can't escape until they defeat Bobbity. He then sends Pui Pui out to confront the heroes, while he puts the energy Spopovich and Yamu collected into the steel ball. Though after he saw how much energy Spopovich and Yamu collected, he regretted killing them. Back with the heroes, instead of playing rock, paper, scissors to decide who goes first, Roshi would step up first, as he wanted to help him protect the earth once more. When Pui Pui starts to attack Roshi, they'll be able to easily block his attacks, and it starts beating him down, so Bobbity transports them onto Pui Pui's home planet, Planet Zoom. Pui Pui thought he would have the advantage because of his planet's gravity being ten times Earth's, but Roshi trained in that gravity before, so it was nothing to him. So, he then used his Kamehameha, which easily killed Pui Pui. The heroes then descended to the next stage, which is when Bobbity sent out Yakon. Goku stepped up to take him on, though Bobbity transported them to Yakon's planet, which was completely dark. Even then, Goku managed to dodge his attacks, but he then turned into a Super Saiyan to light up the area. Yakon then absorbed his light energy, which forced Goku to drop back into his base form. However, he tried turning into a Super Saiyan again, so Yakon started to absorb his energy again. He then went into a Super Saiyan 2 form, which caused Yakon to absorb so much of the light energy that he swelled up and exploded. They then descend to the third stage, which is when Deborah decided to take them on himself. Deborah then stepped out, which is when Goku told Gohan it was his turn, so he stepped out to take him on. Back at the World Martial Arts Tournament, since the fighters were mostly the heroes this time around and they left, the only people left in the tournament were Hercule and 18. So, they would step into the ring, and after their fight begins, 18 would likely still get him in a headlock and threaten to defeat him if he didn't give her 20 million zenny. Though without him being at the same height and popularity as he normally is, he doesn't have that amount of money. After hearing this, 18 easily picks him up and throws him out of the arena, thus becoming the next world champion. At this time, Videl would arrive back at the arena, which is when she tells Goten and Trunks what has been going on. They thought this was cool and they wanted to see a warlock and a genie, so they took off towards the other heroes. Back at Bobbity's ship, the boar would have Bobbity transport himself and Gohan outside. After they were transported outside, their fight began. Gohan would be fighting him as a Super Saiyan, but since he never slacked on his training in this timeline, he would be having an easier time beating down the Bora. The Bora, out of desperation, would try to use his spit against Gohan, but since it just hits his glove, Gohan rips it off before he can turn to stone. The Bora then magically makes a sword, but Gohan easily catches it between his hands and snaps it in half. Without Vegeta being around to interrupt their fight, and knowing they're still having evil in their hearts, he couldn't retreat the Bobbity to have and try to take control of them. So, Gohan would start to knock the Bora around, then the Demon King would also be getting in hits of his own. However, when Gohan turns into a Super Saiyan 2, the Bora no longer stands much of a chance against him. He would be pummeling him into the ground, but before Bobbity could transport him back to the ship, Gohan would blast him at point blank range and kill him in a similar way that he killed Kabito. With the Bora now killed, Piccolo and Krillin would turn back into their normal selves. Also, since the Bora was killed, back in the spaceship, the hole in the ground would open to the next floor. As Goku Goku, Roshi, and Shin descend to that floor. Bobbity would be there waiting for them. Shin would step up to fight Bobbity, but so his ship and the sealed ball weren't damaged in the process, Bobbity transports all of them outside the ship. When he and Shin begin to fight, their magic abilities would be able to counteract each other. Bobbity couldn't do a lot to physically fight Shin, so he would be relying on his magic to stop Shin from being able to do anything to him. But since Bobbity would be distracted by Shin, this gives Piccolo the chance to approach him from behind and slice him in half, like he did in the original story. With the Warlock now sliced in half and lying on the ground, Shin uses this chance to finish off Bobbity once and for all. Now that Bobbity and all his henchmen were taken out, Shin only had to decide what to do with the sealed ball. Roshi would have a brief idea to help Shin, so he would use the Kai Kai to get something from the lookout before returning. He then descended into Bobbity's spaceship, and when he exited it, he handed a jar to Shin. 
He had used the evil containment wave to seal the sealed ball inside of it, so that it would be easier to transport it so that no one could access it. With Shin now having the sealed ball in his possession, he would decide to take it to the sacred world of the Kai to hide it, though he doesn't leave right away, as he would stick around for the heroes gathering the Dragon Balls to revive the people killed by Bobbidi and his henchmen. Before they gathered the Dragon Balls, Shin would have Bobbidi's ship destroyed, so Piccolo fired a blast down the entrance to it, thus destroying it. Anyway, they would gather the Dragon Balls at Castle Corporation to make this wish. Kabita would be revived, so Shin fills him in on what he missed. This is where Shin would have prepared to leave, but he would extend an invitation to Roshi to come train with him. He offered this to Roshi since he trained with the other Kais before, he is the guardian of Earth, and he helped Shin out with transporting the sealed ball. Roshi would take him up on this offer, but he would also suggest that Shin should train Gohan. He might think it is time to pass on the mantle of protecting the Earth to the next generation. As Gohan managed to prove himself by taking out the biggest threat they face today, Shin would be fine with this, though Gohan would convince Shin to take the devil with them too, so he wanted to spend more time with her and continue to help her with her training. So, after discussing this, Shin and Kabita would take Gohan, Videl, and Roshi to the sacred world of the Kais, where they would begin their training under them. Now that the resurrection of Boo was stopped before Bobbidi could reach his goal, the Earth was returned to a time of peace. Regardless, since Shin offered to train Roshi, and he convinced Shin to train Gohan and Videl as well, they all went to the sacred world of the Kai together after they arrived, and before they could start their training, Kabito gave them clothing like a Supreme Kais. Anyway, they would eventually arrive at the Sword in the Mountain since Shin planned for that to be their first test. Videl would give it a shot first, but since she doesn't know the Kaioken or anything, she wouldn't be able to pull it out in just her base form. Gohan tried to pull it out next, but in his base form, it wouldn't budge. But when he turns into a serious hand, he manages to pull it out of the mountain. However, he quickly reverts to his base form, though he was having trouble swinging it in that form. When Kabito tells him he doesn't know how to wield it, Gohan lets him try to lift the sword to show him how to wield it, but Kabito can't even lift it off the ground. Regardless, the three would take turns training with the sword, though with Gohan knowing Super Saiyan and Roshi named the Kaioken, they had an easier time with lifting the sword than Videl did. Roshi would have tried to teach her the Kaioken, but she refused to learn it at first, and she wanted to prove she could do it in her own way. But that if she managed to lift it, she would let Roshi teach her the Kaioken. So, she never gave up on trying, and she kept training her strength with Shin and Kabito until she was able to lift the sword on her own. After she managed to lift the sword, they kept training with it until Gohan no longer had to use Super Saiyan to lift it, and Roshi didn't have to use the Kaioken to lift it. Out of the three of them, ironically it was Videl who took to using the sword the most, since Gohan and Roshi don't really fight with weapons, while Videl was more open to learning how to use them. The one day, while Gohan was training with the sword, Shin got the idea to test the sword's strength. He then materializes a block of catching and throws it at Gohan, and when he tries to use the sword to cut it in half, the sword breaks. This shocked Shin and Kabito, so they didn't think it could break, but out of the sword popped the old Kai. He would reveal who he was and mention that he was sealed in the sword by someone, though he claims they were sealed in it because of his special power. So, they asked him what this power was, and he explained how he could draw out someone's dormant potential. However, since there are three of them training with Shin, it would take him longer to draw out their dormant potential. We don't know if he can unlock multiple people's potential at the same time, so I'm going to assume he can only unlock one person's potential at a time. He would start with unlocking Gohan's potential, so Gohan had to sit down in front of the old Kai, since he couldn't move during the ritual. While Gohan was going through the ritual, this this gave Roshi the time to start teaching Videl the Kaioken. Like with flying, it would take a bit to get the hang of it, but she would show brief signs of being able to use it early on. By the time the ritual was done, she hadn't completely managed to use it, so when Roshi went to get his potential unlocked, she kept practicing it on her own. After giving her some last minute advice, Roshi sat down with the old Kai as he began the process of unlocking Roshi's dormant potential. While he was going through the ritual, Videl continued to practice using the Kaioken while Gohan would train with her. Another thing to potentially mention about Videl's training is that since she was doing so well with the Z Sword and she enjoyed enjoyed training with it, she might ask Shin about having another sword made for her to use. While we do know that it was Beerus who sealed the old Kai and the Z-Sword, we don't know if he made the Z-Sword or obtained it from someone. Regardless, it would take years for Shin to be able to meet up with him to get another Z-Sword, since he isn't due to wake up until years from now, which he would let her know that it could take years to get another one, but the moment he does receive one, he will give it to her. Regardless, after Roshi finished having his potential unlocked, Videl would go sit with the old Kai to have her dormant potential unlocked. Of course, while she was going through the ritual, Gohan and Roshi would train together. Eventually, after her potential is unlocked, they would all thank the old Kai for unlocking their potential. Though the three of them would continue to train with Shin and Kabito, at least until Videl managed to learn the Kaioken. After she does, they would thank Shin and Kabito for training them, as Roshi then uses the Kai Kai to transport himself, Gohan, and Videl back to Earth. Now, my next decision is probably one people aren't going to be happy with, but I've decided not to cover Dragon Ball Super in this timeline. There are two reasons I've done this, with the first reason being that I wanted this timeline to focus more on the humans, and Dragon Ball Super focuses more on the Saiyans. Speaking of the Saiyans, that brings me to the second reason why, which is that in Battle 
Battle of Gods, there wouldn't be enough pure-hearted Saiyans to do the ritual. Sure, they would have six Saiyans if Tarbal, Broly, and Paragus were gathered, but Paragus isn't pure-hearted and Beerus isn't patient enough to wait for him to become pure of heart. We also have no idea if Tarbal is pure-hearted, since we never see him, and he's only mentioned in some of the movies. Even if the revelation of Videl being pregnant still happened, there's the possibility that they're down one Saiyan, depending on if Tarbal is pure-hearted or not. So, I decided to skip Dragon Ball Super, since the Battle of Gods did happen, it would end badly for the heroes. I'm still thinking about covering one thing from Dragon Ball Super though, since it mostly has to do with the humans. Regardless, after Roshi, Gohan, and Videl arrive on Earth, they would continue their training. Videl would train with Roshi some more, so that she could learn to master the Kaioken like he did. That is, she does master it, so she has the ultimate form as well, and her free time she might try to combine the Kaioken with her ultimate form. Now if that would work, well it's hard to say for sure, but I don't see why it couldn't. Another thing to mention is that four years later, she would have kept his promise with Videl, since Beerus woke up at this time. So, he used the Kai Kai to go to Beerus' planet, as he even asked Beerus about getting a new Z-Sword. Of course, knowing these two, there would probably be some amount of bickering between them. Though at the end of the day, Beerus will likely relent and have Whis use his stat to materialize a new Z-Sword. This time, however, Whis will likely materialize a better sword than the old one, so that it couldn't break as easily. After receiving the sword, Shin would head back to Earth with it, where he would give it to Videl. Of course, she would thank him for this, and she promises they won't break it this time. Shin then returned to the sacred world of the Kai, while Videl and the others continued to train on Earth. Even though they are in a time of peace, they would try not to slack on their training, though it's possible Gohan might start to slack on his training eventually, especially after he gets more job opportunities related to being a scholar. So, while he would be stronger than he normally is at the time of the superhero movie happening, he likely would have started to slack on training since the Earth was in a time of peace and he was following his dream of being a scholar. Though Videl would get him to train with her every now and again, it wasn't enough to keep him from being rusty. Regardless, the Earth is in a time of peace again, so the heroes would be able to return to their normal daily lives, at least for now. A long time ago, when the Red Ribbon Army was still around, they were led by Commander Red. However, they were defeated by a young child named Goku, the their head scientist, Dr. Jiro, escaped and made the androids in Cell years later. Commander Red's son, Magenta, spent his time trying to bring the Red Ribbon Army back by using Red Pharmaceuticals as a front company. Nine years after the defeat of Bobbity, Magenta and Carmine, his second in command, learned of Dr. Jiro's grandson, Dr. Hedo, though he is currently in prison. When Dr. Hedo was released from prison, Carmine and Magenta pulled up in a car and invited him in, though he already knew who they were, as he used Hachimaru, a spy robot, to trail them after he first seen Carmine at the prison. Regardless, after he gets in the car, Magenta proposes that he should come work for them. He was reluctant to do so, since he knew that Red Pharmaceuticals was the Red Ribbon Army, and his grandfather's connection to the Red Ribbon Army caused trouble for himself and his parents. Though he is also a superhero fan, so he doesn't agree with their goal of world domination. Carmine tried to threaten him with a gun, but he revealed he injected himself with a serum to be bulletproof and he reveals that Hachimaru carries the lethal poison. So, Magenta appeals to his heroism by saying that Castle Corporation is hiding a group of aliens who want to take over the world themselves, and he mentions that the androids and Cell were made to stop them. He then shows Dr. Hedo footage of Goku killing Vegeta. So, as they arrived at Red Pharmaceuticals, he agreed to assist them in creating the ultimate android superheroes. Six months later, Piccolo was training Pan in the woods near his house. She wanted to learn how to fly, but she couldn't do so yet. Piccolo told her not to worry about it, as it would come to her. Regardless, she still asked if her dad could really be stronger than Goku, so she has never seen him fight. While Gohan did train for longer than normal in this timeline, he still slacked on his training after the Elder Kai unlocked his potential. Anyway, Piccolo tells Pan that he could be, but he isn't so sure about him currently. She then heads off to Kindergarten, so Piccolo returns to his house. Once there, he gets a call from Videl asking him to pick up Pan after school, so she'll be busy preparing her martial arts school for a tournament and Gohan is busy with his research. Briefly off topic, we never see or hear what Videl's martial arts school is called, but I chose to give it a name in this timeline. I only did this since I thought her martial arts school would become a major focus later, since the other heroes also started martial arts schools in this timeline. Anyway, I decided to call her school the Ram School, as a connection to her name being an anagram of devil, since a ram is a symbol of the devil. Regardless, Piccolo agrees to pick her up after school, so Videl offers to buy him a stuffed animal in return. He then goes to Gohan's house and asks why he can't pick up Pan, which is when Gohan tries to explain his research about Anne but Piccolo wasn't interested. Instead, he asks if research is more important than his family and tells him that he should train in case evil were to show up again. Gohan waves his office and says things will be fine with Goku there. So, Piccolo throws a punch at Gohan, though he does block it, but he's been hit in the gut by Piccolo. He then changes Gohan's clothing into clothes like his own with a weighted cape.
escape. This causes Gohan to collapse under the pressure, but he tells him to leave them on, as he will go pick up Pan. Piccolo then returned home to meditate, but he was suddenly attacked by Gamma 2. Piccolo immediately noticed the red ribbon logo and that he was an android. Anyway, Gamma 2 reveals he was sent there to subjugate Piccolo, but he decided to kill him instead, as they began to fight. He believed he killed Piccolo with his blast, so Gamma 2 then leaves. However, Piccolo just managed to dodge his blast and slip away in the dust, so he follows the android to the Red Ribbon Army's new headquarters. Once there, he subdues the guard and takes his uniform, wearing it as a disguise. Piccolo then sneaks into a control room where Magenta, Carmine, Dr. Hedo, and the Gammas were having a meeting, while other soldiers stood guard. Gamma 1 was currently chastising Gamma 2 for not confirming Piccolo's death, since the camera footage shown that he escaped. This angered Magenta, since this could reveal their identity, so they might have to hasten their plans. He ordered Dr. Dr. Hedo to finish Cell Max, but he was confident that the Gammas could finish this on their own. Also, the Cell Max's control system wasn't finished, he could easily turn against him if he was activated. After hearing this, Piccolo slips away to call Bulma. As he asks if Goku is around, Bulma reveals that he went to the Sacred World of the Kais, so they don't have a way to get in contact with them, so he heads to Corrin's Tower to get some sensory beams while they devise a plan. Up on the Sacred World of the Kai, Goku is sitting down to get his potential unlocked by the old Kai, so he can't get up until hours from now since the ritual takes a while to complete. Back on Earth, Korn gives Piccolo the only two sensor beans he had left. Regardless, he can't get in touch with Goku, Gohan doesn't seem to want to take action, and he can't risk jeopardizing the androids in case Dr. Hedo finds her weak points. So, with there not being many options left to defend the Earth, he heads up to the lookout. This time, he went up there for two reasons, to ask about getting his potential unlocked, and to get Roshi's help. He knew that Roshi had his potential unlocked by the old Kai, but since they don't have time for that, he would ask if the Dragon Balls would be able to unlock his potential. Roshi said that they could do this, he would just have to upgrade them. After upgrading them, Piccolo would get Roshi to come along and help them, as they then head to Castle Corporation, since Roshi figured Bulma already had the Dragon Balls collected. Once there, they summon Shenron, and Piccolo used his first wish to unlock his latent potential. Shenron grants this wish, and he also notes that he threw in the bonus for Piccolo. Bulma then uses the other two wishes for minor cosmetic changes, though after using them, she realizes they could have used a third wish to wish Goku there. Piccolo chastises her for it, but she points out that he didn't think of it either. So, he and Roshi then head to the Red Ribbon Headquarters together. Once they arrive, Roshi subdues the soldier as well, so that he can disguise himself. Anyway, Magenta and Carmine were in a hurry to hasten their plans, so they made a plan to lure in Gohan next. Since they knew he has a daughter, they decided to kidnap her to lure him to the base, so that their identities are revealed to the public. Piccolo and Roshi would volunteer to go kidnap them, as they claim to be familiar with her, as they say that they are neighbors of Gohan. Both are allowed to go, but they are paired up with soldier number 15 for the mission. Regardless, Piccolo realizes this could be what it takes to snap Gohan back into action, so he fills Roshi in on his plan. When they arrive at Pan's kindergarten, number 15 is knocked unconscious immediately when he tries to say he's there to take her home. The she recognizes Piccolo and Roshi by their key, so they take her and the unconscious number 15 back onto the plane. Once on the plane, Piccolo and Roshi tell her the plan, as they then deliver her to the Red Ribbon base. She then feigns terror in a recording made to lure Gohan in, so Piccolo, Roshi, and number 15 go to deliver the message. As usual, Gohan wasn't bothered by number 15 holding him at gunpoint, but when he is shown the video of Pan, he flies out of the window. He then turns into a Super Saiyan, which creates a crater and causes his house to topple. Now panicking, number 15 ensures that Pan is unharmed, apologizes, and politely asks Gohan to come along. Once they arrive at the base, Gohan rushed towards Pan, who is at the top of the tower behind the soldiers, Magenta, Carmine, and the Gammas. Gamma 1 gets in his way, so they begin to fight, but Gohan is struggling against him while in his base form. Even when he turns into a Super Saiyan, he is still at a disadvantage against the android. Piccolo and Pan then feign a performance where he threatens her, but to his surprise, the Gammas protest this. Regardless, this causes Gohan to go into his potential unleashed form, which finally allows him to gain the upper hand over Gamma 1. Gamma 2 is then ordered into the fight as backup, Piccolo steps up to take him on. He powers up into his new potential unleashed form, but Gamma 2 reveals he was holding back power. He puts Piccolo on the back foot again, as he then knocks him down into a crevice. While he was falling, Piccolo remembered what Shenron said about throwing in a bonus. His skin then turned orange, a sigil appeared on his back, he grew bulkier, and his antenna stands on end. In this form, he manages to take out Gamma 2 with a single punch. Meanwhile, Pan started to fight her way through the Red Ribbon Army soldiers, which she was beating them easily. Since the Gammas lost their advantage, Magenta and Carmine started retreating. Though Pan got in Carmine's way, he tried firing a gun at her, but she dodged all his shots. Carmine's actions outraged the Gammas, as they didn't realize they have been tricked by Magenta and Carmine, so they stopped their fights with Gohan and Piccolo. Regardless, Pan manages to knock out Carmine. However, Magenta slips away, 
Dr. Hedo heads out after him. Now that the battle is seemingly over, everyone regroups, but the Gamma's following them. Bulma then arrives, but she brought Trunks, Goten, Krillin, and 18 for backup. Piccolo was surprised to see how much Goten and Trunks have grown since he last saw them, but Gohan reminds him about how they stay small until they hit a certain age, which they then have a large growth spurt. Regardless, Gohan asks Piccolo about his new form, and he claims it was because Shenron was generous with the bonus he's given him. Since Gohan asks him to name the form, and he tells Piccolo that he was orange in the form, he decides to call it Orange Piccolo. Inside the base, Magenta was preparing to awaken Cell Max. The Dr. Hedo tried to stop him, so Magenta shot him before he undid more of Cell Max's restraints. The Dr. Hedo still gets up and reminds Magenta about his toughened skin. This is when Magenta reveals that his body was cybernetically enhanced, that as he prepares to fight Dr. Hedo, Hachimaru stings him on the back of the neck. Hachimaru's poison starts to kill Magenta, but he uses his final moments to free Cell Max. So he begins to break free from his chamber. As the sky darkens, Cell Max explodes from beneath the base. So, Piccolo tosses the sensu beam to Gohan, but since he didn't have his glasses on, he failed to catch it and it fell into a crevice. Goten, Trunks, 18, the Gammas, Roshi, Piccolo, and Gohan then charge into battle. But since Gohan was tired from his last fight, he is only able to turn into a Super Saiyan. While they began to fight, Krillin chose to stay back with Bulma and Pan to ensure that nothing happened to them. The Gammas revealed that Dr. Hedo had built a weakness into the top of Cell Max's head. None of the heroes were able to do much against him, and Piccolo's explosive demon wave aimed at Cell Max's weak point was shrugged off. Since the heroes never learned the fusion dance in this timeline, Goten and Chunks can't fuse together. Instead, the other heroes would distract Cell Max for them. This gives him the opening to headbutt his weak point together, thus producing cracks on his head. Gamma 2 then planned to try and sacrifice himself to deliver the final blow, but Roshi stopped them. He originally stayed back to let the next generation like Gohan handle this, but he figured now would be the time to show something he has unlocked. After seeing Fidel manage to combine the Kaioken in the Potential Unleashed form, he got the idea to try and surpass the Potential Unleashed form in his own way. It took him a while to achieve this, but nine years have passed since Bobbity was defeated, so he had a lot of time to work on making this form. As he begins to transform, he is surrounded in a white aura. Behind them, a large light blue dragon made of key appears, with it looking like Shenron. The name I decided to call this form is basic, but then again so is Orange Piccolo. Regardless, I chose to call this form Draconic Roshi, for obvious reasons. Anyway, with the help of the others, Cell Max is put into a position where Roshi can attack his weak spot. So, he would fire a Kamehameha at Cell Max, but this Kamehameha would be entwined with a key dragon behind them. So I called this version of the Kamehameha the Draconic Kamehameha. Unfortunately for Roshi, Cell Max blocked this at the last second, so it only took off one of his arms. Though, this results in an explosion, and to escape it, Pan learns how to fly. The enraged Cell Max tried to stomp on Roshi, but this is when Piccolo intervened, as he returned to his orange form. He was holding up Cell Max's foot, the Krillin then reminds him of his gigantification technique. After turning into his giant form, he still struggles against Cell Max. Even with Roshi and Piccolo attacking Cell Max together, they weren't doing much to the monster. So, they put their hopes into Gohan, as they say that they will hold off Cell Max long enough for Gohan to get in a good hit on his weak point. After giving Gohan the last sensu beam, Piccolo and Roshi begin an uphill battle with Cell Max. But they also receive support from the other heroes, while Gohan charges his power. Then when Cell Max uses an attack that seemingly kills Piccolo and Roshi, Gohan awakens past his potential unleashed form and into his beast form, as his hair turns white and his irises turn red. He then easily withstands Cell Max's attacks, before countering with one of his own. This overwhelms the monster, so he begins to charge a massive ball of energy, before collapsing it into a concentrated attack. This is when Piccolo recovers and Roshi gets back up, as Piccolo holds Cell Max in place. Since Piccolo was struggling to hold him in place, Roshi would help restrict Cell Max by using the key dragon to wrap itself around the monster. Though, Cell Max just barely manages to launch his energy ball, but Gohan then uses a special beam cannon. This attack pierces both the energy ball and Cell Max's head, as he falls to the ground and explodes so the heroes then escape from the blast. Pan then rushes up to Roshi, Piccolo, and Gohan, as they revert to their normal forms. While Gohan and Pan embrace, both Roshi and Piccolo congratulate Gohan, but Gohan still mentions that even if Goku was there, they may not have been able to defeat Cell Max. That's when Piccolo tells them that's why it's important for him to stay prepared in case any other threat arises. Anyway, Dr. Hedo was repentant of his actions, as he knew he was being used but he chose not to care, so he decided to turn himself in to the police. However, Bulma offered him and the Gamma's place as a capsule corporation since Dr. Dr. Hedo's skin serum could be useful in cosmetic research. Now that the latest threat was taken care of, Pan happily flies around everyone. In the post credit scene, Goku finishes the ritual with the old Kai, and with the help of Shin, he returns to Earth. Though, when Gohan tells him about the battle he missed, he pouts because he missed out on all the fun of having a good fight. However, once he hears about Gohan's newfound power, he likely drags his son into a sparring match. 
12 years after the defeat of Bobbidi, Goku was behind his house, training with Goten. This saga only happens 12 years later in this timeline instead of 10 years later since the World Martial Arts Tournament continued to happen every 3 years in this timeline. The closest tournament that would have happened after age 784 would be in age 786. This tournament would be the 33rd World Martial Arts Tournament. Anyway, while Goku was training with Goten, Yamcha and Bulma would arrive to talk with Goku. It's likely Yamcha would have heard the rumor about Goku joining the tournament, so he decides to join as well, for old times sake. Trunks then arrives, and shortly afterwards Pan arrives as well. She has been training with Goku, so she has just gotten back from flying around the world. Anyway, Trunks asks Goten if he was joining, but she reveals that Goku is making him. Yamcha likely then makes Trunks join as well, but regardless, they then discuss telling the other heroes. Since Krillin, Chi Chi, Tien, and Shotsu all have their own martial arts schools, they are told about how they are participating in the tournament as well. Of course, they tell Roshi about their participation too, so he joins as well. Piccolo, Gohan, and Videl might join too since they continued to fight and had started their own martial arts school in this timeline as well. The next day, the tournament would begin as per usual, but since 18 is the champion in this timeline, Hercule isn't in this tournament. Also, since Boo was never released, Boo wouldn't be around either. Regardless, not counting 18. The finalists of the tournament would be as follows Goku, Gohan, Goten, Chichi, Pan, Videl, Yamcha, Trunks, Bola, Krillin, Marin, Tien, Shatsu, Piccolo, Roshi, and Nock. I only added Bola and Marin into this since in a timeline where their father started their own martial arts school, they might have begun to train. Also, since Marin, Bola, and Pan would be close friends, they might have all inspired each other to train together. I only kept Nock in the list if there was an even 16 fighters in the finals, when not counting 18. I only increased the size of the tournament to 16 fighters just to make it more interesting. Lastly, I didn't count 18 in the list, since I'm assuming this tournament would be like the actual 28th World Martial Arts Tournament, where Hercule didn't play through the rounds would have had to face whoever the last fighter to remain was. Though, since none of them really have a desire to be champion except for 18, there still might be a similar agreement in place where they'll throw the final match so 18 wins again. I randomly generated the fights for the first round, and they ended up as follows. Match 1 is Pan vs Roshi, Match 2 is Goku vs Chi Chi, Match 3 is Marin vs Krillin, Match 4 is Piccolo vs Goten, Match 5 is Trunks vs Bola, Match 6 is Gohan vs Videl, Match 7 is Shotsu vs Tien, and Match 8 is Nock vs Yamcha. Before the tournament begins, the heroes will likely limit themselves to not transforming, so that some of the others can have a better chance to win. Anyway, Pan and Roshi would then enter the ring together. Even though Pan would have trained with Goku, her parents, and Piccolo in this timeline, she likely couldn't and beat Roshi. It doesn't mean it wouldn't be a good fight, though, since Roshi would likely suppress himself somewhat for the fight. This way, he could try to use this fight to teach her a lesson like how he did to Goku and Krillin during the 21st World Martial Arts Tournament. Throughout their fight, Roshi would grow more impressed with her power, but he would end it by knocking her out of the ring. However, he might offer to train her to get better control of her power after the tournament is over. Next is the second match between Goku and Chi Chi, so they would both enter the ring. With Chi Chi having continued to train in this timeline, she would stand a better chance against Goku than she did in their fight during the 23rd World Martial Arts Tournament. Though, unfortunately for her, Goku has an advantage in power because of his Saiyan biology. It would be a long fight though. Goku would have suppressed himself as well. Eventually, however, it would end up with Goku managing to get the win over Chi Chi. As for match 3, which is between Marin and Krillin, he would likely take it easy on her since it's his daughter he's fighting. It doesn't mean Krillin would throw the match, though. He'd still eventually knock her out of the ring. He just takes it easy on her so that they can have a good fight. Mainly, he would be wanting to test her strength to see how her training was coming along so far. Regardless, after he's seen how far she had come along, he would then knock her out of the ring. Next is match 4 between Piccolo and Goten. So then we'll see Piccolo being the one to try and make it a long and drawn out fight. He might briefly spar with Goten, but he would easily be able to knock him out of the ring. Then as for match 5, which is between Trunks and Bola, I could see it being like match 3. Trunks would likely want to test his little sister's strength. Since he likely helped train her, but he'd go easy on her at first, though he would still be the one to knock her out of the ring. Since match 6 is between Gohan and Videl, it could end up being the match they wanted to have against each other back at the start of the Boo Saga, but never got the chance to. Though, this would end up like the match between Goku and Chi Chi. Gohan likely would have suppressed himself so that he and Videl could have a good fight, though at the end of it, Gohan would come out on top, so he would eliminate her from the tournament by knocking her out of the ring. Since the 7th match is between Shotsu and Tien, it would be a friendly match, with how strong Shotsu is in comparison to Tien, he wouldn't stand a chance against Tien. He would give it his all, though, but he would eventually be knocked out of the ring. 
This brings us to the 8th and final match of the first round, which is between Nock and Yamcha. Though there isn't a reason to go into detail with this fight, since Nock wouldn't stand a chance when he'd be knocked out of the ring easily. So, the matches in round 2 are as follows. Match 9 is Roshi vs Goku, Match 10 is Krillin vs Piccolo, Match 11 is Trunks vs Gohan, and Match 12 is Tien vs Yamcha. The first match of the second round, which is Match 9 altogether, is between Roshi and Goku. It would be reminiscent of their fight in the 21st World Martial Arts Tournament, with neither of them being able to transform in this fight, and with Roshi being much stronger in this timeline, it would end up being a close fight. They would be able to go blow for blow with each other like they did in their first fight. However, instead of it ending with a victory for Roshi, I think Goku would win this fight. Next, match 10 would be between Krillin and Piccolo. Though like Piccolo's fight against Goten, he wouldn't drag this fight out either. So, while Krillin would put up a good fight, he would be knocked out of the ring too. And as for match 11, it is between Trunks and Gohan. Unlike the last fight, Gohan might drag this one out for longer just so he can test Trunks' power. Seeing Trunks all grown up might remind him of future Trunks from long ago, so this match could be resembling of when future Gohan and future Trunks used to train together. Lastly, in match 12, it would be a friendly match between Tien and Yamcha. Though unlike Tien's match to Shatsu, this would be a closer fight since they are closer in power. However, it's likely that Tien would still have the advantage of power against Yamcha. So, while the fight would go on longer than Tien and Shatsu's fight, Yamcha would be eliminated. This makes the matches in round 3 as follows. Match 13 is Goku vs Piccolo, and match 14 is Gohan vs Tien. Like how Goku's last match is reminiscent of the 21st World Martial Arts Tournament, match 13 would be reminiscent of the 23rd World Martial Arts Tournament since it is between Goku and Piccolo. This would be another long and drawn out fight, though it is hard to say who the winner would be. Piccolo was able to match the power of Super Saiyan before, but Goku has also grown exponentially stronger in his base form. So, since Goku is still the main protagonist of this story, I decided for him to get the win in this fight. This means after a long and drawn out fight, Piccolo is eliminated from the tournament. The last match in this round is match 14, and it is between Gohan and Tien. Again, Gohan might suppress himself in this fight, so they could be like a sparring match with Tien. Though, he would still eventually eliminate Tien from the tournament as well. This makes it so that the only match of round 4 is as follows. Match 15 is Goku vs Gohan. Of course, this is a match that would end up going on for a while as well, though I think Goku would be the one to win in it. Even though Gohan got back into fighting after the superhero movie, Goku never stopped fighting, so he might be slightly ahead of Gohan in terms of power. I think their fight would end with a beam struggle with them both using a Kamehameha, but Goku's would knock Gohan out of the ring. This means that the championship match is 18 vs Goku, Though, as Goku promised he would, he purposely throws his match so that 18 can be the winner. Now that 18 is crowned the winner once more, the tournament is over. Afterwards, the heroes might all go their separate ways. However, Pan might go with Roshi so that she can take him up on his offer to get stronger. So, instead of this saga ending with Goku and Oob flying off together, it ends with Roshi and Pan flying off towards the lookout together. As a brief side note, I almost tried to come up with the characters that would be the students of the current heroes, along with commissioning art of them. Though I changed my mind about doing so, eventually, however, I might make community posts of some of these characters I had in mind if I still decide to do so. I just didn't want to introduce that many original characters into a story, so I decided against doing it. Also, so, I didn't commission art of older versions of some of the characters, so that's why I still use their end of Z renders. Anyway, time to get to the main point of this video. After the 33rd World Martial Arts Tournament ended, the world has been in a time of peace. Master Roshi would have continued to be the Guardian of Earth, though he would also spend time with the other heroes between his Guardian duties. He would also have trained Panda after the tournament, like he had promised to. During this training, he probably would have taught her in the Turtle School way, along with training her in similar ways to how Kami used to train students of his. Pan being trained like this would also help fulfill a wish of Goku's in this timeline, which is that the next generation would be able to protect the Earth. After all, since he never died against Cell in this timeline, and didn't have to take over to defeat Boo, he would still want to pass the torch on to the next generation, which, speaking of Goku, he would work to fulfill his wish by continuing to train Earthlings, since he had started his own martial arts school. Though he also might continue the friendly rivalry he has with his wife, since Chi Chi started her own martial arts school too. This also might mean Goku and Chi Chi don't really have to worry about money, since both would be making money from their schools. Besides Chi Chi, Goku would also have friendly rivalries with most of the Z fighters since they also started martial arts schools in his timeline. Like with Krillin, he took over the turtle school after Master Roshi became the Guardian of Earth. The way he trained students likely would have been very similar to how Roshi trained him and Goku, since he seemed to be the one to utilize the turtle style the most. Of course, now that he is a turtle hermit, he might teach some of his own techniques as well, though he also ends up training his daughter, Marin, in martial arts. Speaking of his family, 18 would have continued to be the world martial arts champion, 
is no one strong enough would appear to be able to challenge her for the title of champion. Only the heroes would be able to beat her, but we've seen how that went in the last tournament, with them willingly throwing the match for 18 to win. As for how long 18 would keep participating in these tournaments, it's hard to say. She'd probably just do it until she no longer needs the money. Which, if Krillin is also making money from his martial arts school, that might come sooner rather than later. I'd only see Krillin being able to make money from his school if 18 made him charge his students to begin their training with him. I don't see it being Krillin's idea to charge them money to train there. Then as for Tien and Shatu, they would continue to run the new Crane school. Since they have this school, they might be less of loners and hang out with the other heroes more often. Other than that, their teachings would be in the Crane style, minus the evil techniques and brutal methods they were taught from Master Shen and Mercenary Tao. Instead, they might teach some of the techniques they know and have come up with. Next, with Yamcha, he would have continued to run his wolf school as well, which Poor would be a teacher there too. While Yamcha teaches the fighting techniques, Poor would be able to teach them shape-shifting. Though unlike Krillin and Goku, he wouldn't be made to charge his students to train in his school. After all, he's married to Bulma in this timeline, and Capsule Corporation makes more than enough money for him and his family. Then with Piccolo, he would have kept up the school at the behest of Chi Chi and Gohan. Though he rarely takes students in comparison to the others since he likes to be alone most of the time. At some point, he probably would have trained Pan like how he trained Gohan, so he might claim her as a student too. Though even when not training her, he would still come and visit Gohan and his family often. Speaking of Gohan and his family, since Videl still trains in this timeline, she probably would have started a martial arts school too. If she and Gohan would both be instructors at it, they might teach their own fighting style to their students, which would be like a combination of Gohan and Videl's fighting styles. Of course, Pain would have trained alongside them as well at some point. Regardless, when Gohan isn't training people, he likely keeps up his studies since he still wants to be a scholar. As for Pan, when she is eventually old enough, I can see her starting a martial arts school of her own. Not only is she the daughter of two martial arts school instructors, but she's also the granddaughter of two world martial arts tournament champions. So, it would be easy for her to advertise and attract people to join her school. The style she teaches might be a blend of all the ones she has learned from her family and friends. The only style I don't see her replicating or teaching anything of is Hercules. As mentioned before, Marin would have trained with both of her parents. Though, she could also try starting a school of her own eventually. I could only see her doing this if she is close to both Pan and Bola. So, when they start schools of their own, Marin will likely be inspired to do the same. So, she would have a friendly rivalry with both Bola and Pan. Speaking of Bola, she would have learned how to fight from Yamcha and Trunks. Though, like Marin, she could have been inspired by Panda to a martial arts school of her own as well. It's hard to say if they would have done this, though, since Marin easily could have followed Krillin in line of being the next Turtle Hermit, while Bola could become an instructor and the eventual leader at Yamcha's school if she wanted. As for Trunks, he had similar opportunities to Bola, since he could also become a teacher in Yamcha's Wolf School. Though he would also have a friendly rivalry with Goten, so they have been close friends forever. Even Goten himself could either start a school of his own or eventually take over Goku or Chi Chi's school, though I think it would be more interesting to see him start his own, so that there are more options out there. Basically, the point is that because of all the heroes' influence on each other, they might all be inspired to start martial arts schools of their own. Of course, with the Z fighters being the ones to train people, the fighters of Earth could become far stronger than usual. Lastly, with Master Roshi, he would continue to be the guardian of Earth. I don't see it being a position he would give up anytime soon, especially since he seemingly can't die of old age. I don't think he's going to step down as guardian in the first future. However, like how he offered to train Pan, I could see him training others of the next generation he finds worthy enough. This way, the next generation can get stronger to protect the Earth from any future threats, without him and the other Z Fighters being the ones to save the day. This doesn't mean he would slack on his training or wouldn't help them out if they needed it. He would still train to help them if they needed it, but if they can solve the problem on their own, he would prefer they do that. After all, the Z Fighters we know aren't always going to be around to save the next generation from any threats they might face.